ground and meet me. Oh, baby, make my body shake. Got the sun coming up and I'm wide awake. Tonight has been a long time coming. Now I can finally see. Everybody wants to play this something. Might as well be with me. I get my groove and swagger on, blasting out my favorite song. Let my freaky out, let it show, let it show. Ain't nothing wrong with confident, loving me, I'm feeling it. Let the rhythm move and let go. But some days I'm feeling so down and ain't feeling so pretty, yeah. But I go on loving myself, cause I don't need that pity, yeah. Cause I get high and low, yeah, dust it off and shake it off. Just watch me. I'ma do my thing, yeah. I'ma do my thing, yeah. I'ma do my thing, yeah. Just watch me. I'ma do my thing, yeah. I'ma do my thing, yeah. I'ma do my thing, yeah. Check my nails, they looking okay. fine. Put my hair back, feeling prime. Yeah. Look up, baby, I'm on a roll. I'm on a roll. Feel the beat is coming strong. Make me wanna clap along. Oh. Feeling good wherever I go. Council member Richens, council member Richens, Tom. Okay, you ready to go? Great. Okay, welcome. Uh, we're going to start off with an invocation. Uh, so Pastor Shannon Scott from Grace Baptist Church will lead us in the invocation tonight. Hello, sir. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mayor Speak. And just a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah to all of you. Thank you for what you do, okay? Okay. 
Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to gather tonight in our city. We're grateful and thankful for your blessings upon our city. We ask you that you would uh, watch over, that you'd guide and protect us, especially as we think about this season. Lord, I pray for uh, health for folks, uh, safety as folks travel from place to place. Uh, Lord, we're mindful of our police officers and our firefighters and those that serve as EMTs and Lord, uh, just for all of those involved in uh, hospital care and all that this season, Lord, we just pray that you'd watch over them, bless each and every family uh, in our city. We pray for these that have responsibility of the business of our city. We pray that you'd give them wisdom, that you'd give them discernment, Lord, even tonight as they make decisions. Lord, I pray that you'd give them favor, help each and every one of us. Uh, Lord, look after us with regards to all the sickness that's going around. We pray that you would uh, lighten our load with these things. Lord, be with our schools, uh, our businesses, every aspect of our city tonight. Look after those that have responsibility in these areas. We love you and thank you for what you'll do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, so next is our uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask Council Member Casillas if she'll help us out tonight. Thank you. Okay, so at this time, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Individuals wishing to address the city council are requested to complete a speaker card and deliver the card to the city clerk staff prior to the item being heard by the city council. Please observe a three minute limit for communications and once called upon to speak, we request that you state your name and city of residence for the record. So first up, we have uh, proclamations, recognitions, and presentations. We have a, a commendation first, a life-saving award. So I'd like to invite uh, Fire Chief Brian Young uh, Jessica Sosa, Carlo Placentia, uh, Liliana Placentia, and Eric Rodriguez to the podium to be uh, recognized. Come on down. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to read this uh, commendation. It's uh, for, let's see, one, two, three, four. Uh, whereas on July 6th, 2022, Corona resident Ingracia Luna Sosa was swimming in with her family in her backyard. At some point, her grandchildren noticed her grandmother had been underwater and not moving. Family members jumped into action, filled vital life-saving roles. These key roles included immediate recognition of the cardiac emergency, activating 911, and performing cardiopulmonary resuscitation until Corona Fire Department personnel res re arrived on scene. Her family successfully resuscitated the patient. She regained a pulse, began breathing, and was transported to the hospital. The patient recovered and was doing well and has since returned home. So whereas, and this is for Eric, um, self selfishly and without hesitation responded to cardiac emergency and initiated life-saving actions. Eric's heroic actions contributed significantly to a positive outcome. Now, therefore, I, West Speak, Mayor of Corona, on behalf of the City Council, uh, do hereby recognize with respect and gratitude the heroic actions and selfless courage of Eric Rodriguez in the act of saving a life. Presented this uh, 7th day of December, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. As he's passing out, I just want to provide another reminder. Um, we've had more of these occurring recently, which is wonderful. And when I say more of these, I mean life-saving endeavors by our citizens. We've seen it recently at schools in a public setting, and, and really more importantly in the private setting. So 70% of the time, these cardiac arrests occur at home. So family members are vital to the overall saveability of the patient. Uh, one of our firefighter paramedics who's instrumental in this program is here, Steve Wells, and he can attest that it's the hard work of everybody in this room, if you get CPR certified, that can have the same outcome and ultimately save a family member. That's the important thing. So I'm so proud of these citizens, and it's just a, a reaffirmation of the great things that happen in this city on a regular basis. So thank you all. And I, I will remind everyone that the CPR training is free. Yep. 
Absolutely free. Every two months. Every two months. So please uh, contact uh, Chief or one of his team, and they'll they'll set you up. So thank you. Let's get a picture here. Okay, gosh, you gotta love that stuff. Uh, that's great. Uh, next up is a recognition for the Boy Scouts partnership with the City of Corona Homeless Solutions. So I'd like to invite up Karen Roper, the Homeless Solutions Manager, Karen Alexander, um, and a CityNet Make It Make It Cozy volunteer, and the Scout leaders to the podium to present uh, the recognition. Come on up. Oh shoot, and I forgot my uh, my little piece of paper. Can you you want to wing it? Okay. Good evening. So tonight we are excited to recognize uh, Boy Scouts of America from uh, Temesel District. Uh, there's a number of different um, troops crews and packs that were involved in working with Homeless Solutions to do a campaign to collect move-in kits. And if you look at the photos up on the screen, you can see all of the wonderful kits that the Scouts collected for all types of um, home furnishings, like sheets, towels, blankets, uh, dishes, even uh, Christmas decorations, beautiful cards, all kinds of supplies that our homeless clients that are graduating from shelter into permanent housing need, and they get stored in the city's Make It Cozy warehouse, and that is a partnership with CityNet, and we have our, where's our lovely K2 Karen Alexander? here who is the CityNet volunteer that manages this amazing program that helps our homeless clients. And the scouts did such an amazing job. The leaders did an amazing job. And we're just truly grateful for what they did to partner with the city of Corona to address homelessness. So we just wanna thank them tonight and recognize all of them. And I know that the mayor has a stack of certificates because there's actually 34 certificates. Not all of the scouts and leaders are here tonight. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for being here. Um, the, the partnership with the Scouts, not just for this program, but has been so important to the city for so many years. And I want to thank all of you for not only for what you've done you know, here with us tonight and celebrating tonight, but for all the things that you do for our community um, all throughout the year. So thank you all very much. OK, step in front. Take a picture. Photo? Yep. You guys want to squeeze in? Yeah. Let's take a picture here. Come on in. Okay, Ms. Edwards, do we have any, any speaker cards for the items so far? Mayor, no, we do not. Okay, great. All right, so we're going to go on to meeting minutes. This is the committee of the whole meeting from November 9th, the study session meeting from November 16th, and a council meeting from November 16th as well. Um, let's see, do my colleagues have any questions, comments in this at all? Great. Uh, Ms. Edwards, are there speaker cards for the, for the meeting minutes? Mayor, no, we do not. Okay, so we have a motion. Move, proof. I pushed the button, but I can go for second. 
I push the button. Sorry, man. Please vote. I refuse. Rebel. Rebel. All right, that passes 5-0. So we're on the consent calendar. Uh, all items listed in the consent calendar are considered to be routine matters, status reports, or documents covering previous city council actions. The item listed on the consent calendar may be enacted in one motion. With the concurrence of the city council, a council member, or any person in attendance may request that any item be removed for further consideration. Um, would my colleagues like to poll any items? 12, please. 12? Okay. 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 None? Vice Mayor, none? Okay, Ms. Edwards, do you have any uh, members of the public? Mayor, yes. I have two speaker cards for agenda item number nine. Okay, and two for number nine. Okay. All right, so can I get a motion for the remaining items? I'll move. <laughs> okay, please vote. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a, a, a quick little jump in the back here and the vice mayor is gonna take over for me. I have a conflict on item number nine as I am a uh, partner on uh, this project. And on number, item number 12 is, uh, happens to be uh, in zone 19, which is uh, LMD that's in my, my neighborhood. So I will take a break and turn this over to the uh, vice mayor. Thank you, sir. Ms. Edwards, I think we'll go in uh, numerical order. So uh, you had two speaker cards for item number nine? Vice Mayor, that is correct. Good evening, Don Fuller. I live here in town. Hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving and uh, so forth. I only wanted to speak on this item because it's, and I'm not clear on all of this. It was my understanding that Mr. Speak had some interest in this, but since he's walked out of the room and recused himself, then it's sort of a moot point. That was all I was just gonna mention. I was just curious about what that was. I'm sure it's all copacetic. I just was gonna bring that up for that reason. Thank you, Thank I'm you. done. Good evening, Joe Morgan, 206 Degrin. You may not be surprised that I have a little more to say about this. Um, first off, I wanna say right off the bat, um, the mayor's an honorable guy, he's honest. I don't think in any way he's, there's any, he's trying to advantage the system. But he's not just, uh, we, we had this argument before, we had this discussion um, regarding the YMCA when Council Member Carrillo was up here and she's the CEO. And it was uh, dutifully pointed out by the, the the city attorney that she was a she was an employee of the YMCA, and so because she was an employee, um, that that it was okay for the council to go ahead and vote on that as long as she recused herself. This is a different situation. Um, the mayor is an owner of this LLC. He's, as I understand it, he is the most significant shareholder of this LLC. Um, very directly, if you vote one way or vote another way, um, you take an entitled and about to expire project with some risk, with well, some financial risk to the investors, and you remove the final hurdle to its entitlement. That will benefit the members and the owners of this LLC directly. And if you don't do it, it's about to expire and it will harm them directly. This will directly come out of the mayor's pocket if you vote no. And that is a clear conflict of interest because you guys are human beings. And, you know, nobody's expecting that, that you guys are superhuman and you could ignore um, whatever, you know, social ramifications might be for not deciding on this. Further, I have a really serious pr uh, a procedural uh, problem with this. Um, this refers in the staff report to conditions of approval. 
the conditions of approval are not in the staff report. No reasonable person, including yourselves, can know whether the conditions of approval have been met. My understanding is talking to staff that there have been many modifications over the years. This thing's been sitting around since 2006. Lo and behold, tonight, this is the last, this is it. If it doesn't go by the 21st, it's gone. So the fact that the conditions and the modifications and when those modifications were done and how those modifications were done are not in the staff report, it's inexcusable. We, this has come up before. This thing comes out Thursday night. I'm here Monday morning. I put in a record request for these, for these conditions and the modifications and all the documents that are associated with it Monday. The request went in around noon on Monday. I was assured that I would have them. I still don't have them. Um, there's no excuse for it. You shouldn't be deciding because you don't know what the conditions are. You just basically have to take your word for it. And in no other case do you ever just have to take the word for it. If you're going to say that you meet some conditions, then those conditions should be forthcoming in the report so you can establish that for yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Do we approve them one at a time or do we do them both at the same time, Ms. Edwards? Vice Mayor, we do one item at the time. Okay. At a time. All right. Well, at this time, I'll take a, I'll take a, anybody that wants to make a motion on this on this agenda, or do we have any questions? So, there is no deferment option because this is the last extension, correct, Mr. Ellis? So, waiting on this for a next council meeting would then, by default, cancel the map. Correct. Yeah. Can I also just mention for the record that the conflict that uh, was referred to with the YMCA involved a contract and in government code section 1090, this is a final map, which only involves the FPPC, so a recusal is all that is required of the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, I'm comfortable with that. Um, I'll make a motion for this item. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Okay, that item passes four to zero. And um, Councilwoman Casillas, you pulled uh, item number 12? Yeah, I think we, do we need to go get the mayor for this one? He from he's, this he's one recused as well? from both of this. Okay. I think this is where he lives. Is that right? Is that correct? Oh, that's right, the LMD. Okay, I just wanted to pull it for um, uh, Mr. Ellis. Uh, I, I just want to highlight some items off the staff report. Um, so this came before us during the workshop, the fall policy workshop in September, and we agreed that uh, we will fund in the interim. And uh, as it's stated in the staff report, it's now been identified that initial outreach will begin in January, where we will... Talk to, fo talk to folks in the, the residents in the area and let them know that their current zone is just underfunded, so they need to raise the fees. Um, the plan then is that the city, the staff will return to city council in March to present the findings and that the ballots will be mailed out in May, June and tabulated in July so that if it's successful, um, the county tax roll will be assessed in August of next year. Are we really confident with this timeline? I'm glad because we need to get it done within the year, but are we confident that we'll be able to get it done before? I have had no reason to believe that we're not, and I'm, uh, I'm getting a nod. And we do have a presentation if you'd like to, to take a little bit more I would. Uh, dive into this. I, but, I would. Uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> I would, Jim. We'll I would be succinct. like to know more. Yes. But if you'd like a little bit more information, um, Please. Donna Finch, assistant to the city manager, can uh, speak to this one. Hi, good evening, council members. Um, so we do have a presentation on this item today. Um, I'm happy to provide more information based off of what's provided in the staff report. Um, so as you did mention, council member Casillas, we did present this item originally to the city council at the fall policy workshop back in September um, to inform the council on the challenges that are currently being experienced in zone 19 um, within LMD 84-2. So the ask um, for you today is a follow-up to one of the requests that was made in that meeting is to provide an interfund loan agreement to be able to 
backfill the negative fund balance of um, approximately $66,000 that's currently within that zone, and then to provide funding to get us through the remainder of the fiscal year. So the interfund loan agreement um, that we're requesting approval of today is $166,548. So um, just to recap a little on some of the um, background on Zone 19, um, I do have the map up before you on the screen. So as you can see, the zone is comprised of roughly 36 acres um, consisting of 3,692 benefit units. And it's, um, it's kind of a patchy area within the um, South Corona vicinity. The zone was established originally in 1986, and it provides landscape maintenance and operating services to the um, property within the, the zone boundaries within that purple area up on the map. Um, currently, the annual assessment within the zone is $126 um, per year that's levied to each benefit unit, and the zone has not received an increase since 2002, so it's been about 20 years. Um, and any increase right now to um, to increase the levy within that zone would require a Prop 218 ballot measure. So um, as I mentioned, the challenges within the zone right now is it's operating at a deficit, and this is due to ongoing increases over the last 20 years in um, the cost of labor, the cost of water, all of the maintenance activities that are associated with maintaining the landscaping within that district. Um, we are anticipating that this deficit will continue to increase um, as new regulations are coming through at the state level um, regarding weed abatement, um, use of electrical equipment for um, landscaping activities, and drought restrictions. And in addition to this deficit, we also have challenges with a significant number or significant area of landscaping that's actually missing within that zone just to deterioration over the year and no funding to replace it. Um, so as I mentioned, we're requesting approval of the city council for an interfund loan agreement in the amount of $166,548 to backfill the negative fund balance from fiscal year 22 and then get us through the remainder of fiscal year 23. Um, the loan would be um, from the general fund to the zone 19 um, account or fund, and it would have an, a rate of um, 3% or the local agency investment fund rate, um, whichever is, um, it would be no greater than 3%. And then it would re be repaid annually over a 10 year period using any available revenue within that um, fund. Um, as we've mentioned, the fund right now doesn't have any money, so um, that fund that that loan would continue to roll over until we are able to generate the um, funding within the the zone to be able to pay it back. So it will stay with that zone and that fund um, indefinitely until we have the funds to be able to pay it back. Um, so as you mentioned, Councilmember Casillas, in the report, we did um, discuss that we are beginning um, to to plan for conducting outreach within the zone to inform the community of the um, funding challenges within the zone. So we do plan to start outreach in um, early to mid-January to let them know of the deficit, to discuss um, preferred service level options. So we have a variety of options that we're preparing based off of what we discussed in the fall policy workshop um, to just try and get uh, sediment from the community on what their preference is as to whether there is even an inter interest in pursuing a ballot measure to increase that, that levy within the zone. Um, we do plan to present the findings of that outreach to the city council in March, and then that would start the timeline for the, the Prop 218 ballot process if the council chooses to move forward with the ballot measure at that time. So um, the timeline that we did put together um, is, is we are confident that we can meet those dates if the council decides to vote in March to proceed with an election. We would be able to mail out the ballots around May or June, hold the election and the public hearing in July, and then that would allow us to make it onto the tax roll in August. So um, that is the uh, presentation. I'd be happy to answer any other questions you have. Thank you, Ms. Finch. Just a couple follow-ups. So the loan will allow for a continuation of service at the current level of service, or will it increase the level of service? The loan is just at the current level of service right now. So residents won't suddenly see an improvement in the maintenance of their landscape. No. And therefore believe that there is no issue. Um, and then when we are doing outreach, are we, will we be also including an, edu an education piece to residents letting them know currently it's not just underfunded, but there's a loan happening? Like the, ser the level of service that's happening now is only happening because there is a, um, 
essentially letting folks know that this is this is it's a one year term. Like we're going to have some really hard decisions to make if this fails, if the voters decide that they don't want to increase their levy. Yes, that'll be all included in part of the education that if the decision or the sentiment of the community is to not move forward with a, an increase that service levels will have to be cut even further. So even to maintain current service levels, a minimal um, assessment increase would be required to maintain okay. at the current level. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Finch. Is that a good question, Phil? Yeah. Um, I was able to walk this area with uh, one of our residents last month. and. In a several block area around his house, there was just a ton of missing vegetation, a lot of dead vegetation, a lot of above ground broken sprinklers, obviously broken. I mean, I consider that like the basics. Are we gonna be able to fix the basics, fix sprinklers so water is watering whatever plants maybe remain? Uh, with the loan, we'll be able to keep the landscaping looking as it does now. So nothing will die further. We'll be able to just maintain it as it is. Um, if there are specific areas that require um, uh, minor maintenance or improvements um, and those requests are put in, I, I believe we would have the funds to be able to go and do that. But there will be no planting of any additional landscaping or anything like that to, to replace anything that's missing. It would just be to maintain what's currently there right now. Okay, thank you. I just had one follow-up question. Could you go back to the first slide that showed the actual zone? This one here, it, is this the way that it is kind of very disjointed and not continuous? Is that because that was indicative of the development at the time? I, I can you ask? Yeah, it, so the zone was established in 1986. Um, we don't really have the history as to why it looks the way that it does. Um, it, it is, as you mentioned, uh, kind of patchy. There's different areas. Um, I believe it's based off of development, but I don't know that for sure. We'd have to look into the history of that to be able to give you um, a, an answer to that question. Okay. You, you know, just because I want to make sure everybody else heard that as well, could you? Our uh, theory on that is, is, is over the course of history, sometimes you get different uh, pieces of the community that get annexed in, and so you'll see little patchworks, and we see that with uh, even some of the CFDs that we have today. So that's probably why you see it the way that it is. Okay. Uh, any, any, any more questions? Nope. Okay. Um, at this time, I'll make a motion to approve this. I'll second. Oh, public comments? Oh, I'm sorry. Do we need to do public comments? I don't think there's any cards for this one. Um, Vice Mayor, we do not have any speaker cards for this item. No. Okay. Please vote. Okay, that item passes. And if, do we want to bring the mayor back or should we leave him? Should we? <laughs> Oh, he heard us. Never mind. <laughs> okay. All right. So we are on. What's that? No. No. There you go. Uh, communications from the public. So this portion of the agenda is intended for general public comment only on items within the council's jurisdiction that are not listed elsewhere on the agenda. Please note that state law prohibits the city council from discussing or taking action on these items. Please observe a three minute limit for communications and once called upon to speak, we request that you state your name and city of residence for the record. Ms. Edwards, are there any speaker cards from the public? Mayor, yes, we have seven speaker cards for communication from the public. Great, come on down. <clears throat> Welcome. Good evening again, Don Fuller. Uh, we should not forget that this is Pearl Harbor Day. And uh, that was 81 years ago. And there are a few people still alive, I believe, who were there on that day, but not a lot. And the number doesn't get any bigger. It just gets shorter all the time. So we should not forget that. I knew a fellow some years ago who was on a ship in the harbor that day and he woke up to a lot of noise and he went out on deck and he had a, 
brief moment of eyeball to eyeball contact with the Japanese pilot of a torpedo plane who was coming in at about the same level he was standing. So we should not forget that. And I don't think there are any uh, Pearl Harbor veterans in the room with us. But I would like to honor all of those who have worn the uniform. So I'm going to make a request of all the people who are in the room who have worn the uniform of the United States military in any way, shape, or form. If you would all just please stand up so we can give you a little hand, please. Anybody? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Come on up. Good evening, Council. My name is uh, Jay Gomez, born here in Corona. Uh, I am the commander of Squadron 742, Joe Dominguez Post of American Legion, Sons of the American Legion, here in Corona. Uh, we're rising up today just to speak, to let the public know about our post and what we're doing and how, how it's going and, and uh, any any rumors or anything going around that, that it's going down are completely false. Um, we're very strong in the community right now. As a son of the American Legion, we are descendants of, male descendants of all veterans of all wars is how we're eligible to join the, the American Legion. Our aim as members of the Son of the Legion is to help incorporate the Legion family as a unified force to help increase contribution totals of cash hours mileage for all our many projects uh, that we support and that what we fund. Um, part of our uh, constitution and what we do and what we've done here in the city of Corona just over the years, uh, my squadron here in Corona, we give scholarships to Corona High School. We give scholarships to Norco High School. We have also uh, donated money to the Junior ROTC here at Corona High School, enabling them to do transportation to fund their, their trips for their marches and what they're doing. They're uh, always help us out and we help them out as much as, as, much as possible. Um, this year, for instance, we're doing Cops and Kids here on December 17th. We made a donation uh, for that and we'll also be putting up a booth handing out uh, toys to the children of Corona, helping them out. Um, so we're in, involved in the community as much as possible. Part of our members are part of the Honor Guard for the American Legion. And we do a lot of uh, not only burials, but we do um, flag raising or where we need them. We also belong to the Riverside National uh, Cemetery Honor Guard over there. Once a one day a month, we volunteer and go do burials for veterans. And we do anyway from 12 to 19 burials in one day. So it's, it's quite a long day when we go out there and do. But uh, we are here for the community. We're all Corona residents. And just want everybody to know that we are there, uh, able to help. And if anybody needs anything or helps, uh, we're looking for members all the time. Like I said, all I need is male descendants of anybody that was uh, in the military. So if your grandfather or your father, stepdad, great grandfather, you want to come join the organization that helps the city of Corona, come see us. We're here in Corona. Been here 75 years. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, members of the council. My name is Richard Cortez. I preside within the city limits of Paris, California, but I was raised in Corona, California. I'm here tonight to give you a progress report on some of the things that we're doing at Post 742 uh, for the first six months of this year and what we want to do in the last six months of the year. Uh, item number one, Dr. Sam Buendrostro, uh, the Corona Norco Unified School District Superintendent after meeting with representatives of Post 216 328, which is in Norco, and 742 approved the American Legion School Award be awarded throughout the uh, school district this year. Uh, in October, 25 members of Post 216 and 742 participated in this year's Mission in 5K Walk. Auxiliary Unit ladies, Legionnaires, and Sons of the American Legion carried our Post and Service branch flags for three miles. Uh, we had a great time. We received a lot of great applause from the community as we walked our mileage. Uh, my chaplain, Ron Fierro, Post 742 chaplain, has created a program he calls America First. It is his brainchild. The credit goes to him, and he is here, and he will tell you about it. Um, Post 742 members repaired the fence and cleaned up the yard of a disabled veteran. 
The Home Depot Foundation is deeply committed to giving back to our veterans. Today, members of their team gathered at the home of James Friend to inspect his home to determine what repairs they will do to his home. James is a U.S. Army Vietnam veteran, excuse me, James is a U.S. Army Vietnam era veteran and a fellow Coronan. Uh, the Remix Dance Group practices daily at the Post. Post 742 supports the Unified United States Deported Veterans Organization located in uh, Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico, and we are co-sponsoring a Christmas party for 24 deported veterans and their families on December 17th. Robert Vivar, their executive director, was raised in Corona and attended Corona schools. Veteran Suicide Awareness. I want to organize and put on a Veteran Suicide Awareness Run in Corona next year, together with Mission 22, Post 216, Veterans Connect, and Veterans Honoring Veterans. Mission 22 has pledged their support for this event. It, it would consist of a 5K uh, run, a 5K walk, and a kids 1K fun run. The Post 742 Auxiliary Unit has a Veterans Coffee event, had a Veterans Coffee event in October, and they also had their kids' Halloween party. The unit will have uh, breakfast with Santa this coming Sunday, and the following day, Monday, they will also have another Christmas coffee for veterans on December 12th. These coffees with, for veterans are great events, and they are very much appreciated and enjoyed by the veterans who attend. The auxiliary unit also collected food items to send packages to our deployed troops, especially Army First Sergeant uh, Manuel Cano, who was deployed at Guantanamo Bay Detention Camp. Uh, and I spoke to him this morning, and the packages are starting to arrive. Uh, Post 742 also gave First Sergeant Cano $750 so he can put on a Christmas party for his men. It is our goal this year at Post 742 to give back to our veterans in the community more than any previous year before today. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks for having me. God bless you guys, city mayor and council. My name is Chaplain Ron Fierro. I'm here representing 742 Joe Dominguez Post American Legion. Um, as my commander just mentioned, um, I did start a, a program in which we're, we're encouraging the trainees as they're coming back, the, the new enlistees. Um, you know, when you go to the military, you go and you, you c c communicate with your, your um, recruiter, but that's the last time you see the recruiter when you get drafted or get enlisted and you come back, no more recruiter. So what I decided to do is go ahead and receive these guys when they come back and go ahead and encourage them and help them around to get lifted up higher so we can con continue to encourage them and build up the, the military as it used to be because the military right now is straggling, as you guys know in the news. Um, I believe that that's very important as um, I'm also a pastor. I've been here before to speak with you guys prior to about the homeless. I do homeless ministry. I do veterans homeless ministry. Uh, my, I guess my, my calling is for the homeless and for those that are struggling out there. I call them least fortunate because one day we never know what's going to be our future and we can be in, in that particular uh, uh, situation. I pray that it's not. But um, again, um, so I just want to give you guys the the upbeat as to what we're doing there at the 742 post. The American Legion is doing a great job. We're standing strong and we're doing the best that we can. Um, I know that um, in Christ that all things are possible and, and I believe that strongly because my past is part of not a good past, but God has turned my life around and I could stand back, stand here where I'm at today to let you guys know that there is a God. And because of that God today, there's hope. Amen. So thank you for listening to me for the few minutes that you guys did. I, there's not much more I have to say. You guys understand where I'm coming from and what I represent and who I, who I, um, who I represent. Amen? Thank you. God bless you guys. Be safe. Welcome. Hi, my name is Dina Lepe, and I am here because we have a short-term rental problem that popped up on our street. Um, they initially conducted their business without a business license, without the appropriate uh, permits through the city. Um, but since, they, since then, they have been approved. Every occupant they've had there has been 
excessively noisy, loud music, profanity. Uh, it's basically become a party house. Um, there's been drug use that's been recorded. Um, the neighbors couldn't use their backyard on Thanksgiving because of the smells that were coming from the drug use. Um, there's been trash on the property overflowing the trash bins. The garbage bins have been out three, four days prior to pickup, two, three days after pickup. Um, there's parking issues. Uh, they, they've parked in front of mailboxes. Um, you know, I hate to nitpick on every little thing. However, we've been instructed to do so, but it still got approved. Police have been called a minimum of six times for um, loud parties, um, and nothing ever happens. There's been arguments, fights. Um, we have many neighbors that work nights or they're firemen and they're gone for days at a time, which is leaving their families um, vulnerable. So all the, a lot of us have small children. And when you are having a motel type situation in your neighborhood, you don't know who's there. So we've been given conflicting information about how to proceed. Um, these people who bought the house in October, they do not live in the state. They live in Oregon. So they are not doing the things that they need to do in order to be compliant with the city rules. Um, the police log was told to me that they were going to be checked before approval. Uh, I don't think they were because it shouldn't have been approved. This is not a destination. This is not a hub for people to come and go to a really nice Disneyland park. This is uh, a quiet community, or at least it was. It is no longer a quiet community. We are all feeling very scared, very unsafe and vulnerable. We need help. We need help to get rid of this out of Corona itself. We definitely need it off our street. And uh, the property address is 3850 Wasatch Drive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Kelly Montalvo, and I reside in Corona. Um, I'm really here tonight to speak on behalf of my family and actually thank the Council Members and, and the Mayor for attending an event that we held on October 22nd in honor of my son, Benjamin, who was um, killed two years ago on Rimpot Avenue. Um, since that time, we've finally been able to come to a point where we're hoping to do some good and work on something in his in his honor. And on October 22nd, we held a bike walkathon. Um, some of the council members and mayor speak attended. We're very grateful for the connections and for the time that you gave us. Our little event raised six thousand eight hundred dollars. Wasn't that much, but I, I think the value in us starting out and hoping to go somewhere from here. Um, we'd like to continue to meet with some of the, I think it's the engineering department, and work with them and figure out what to do with this money and where we can go from here. So I thank you and thank you for your time. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bobby Spiegel, Corona Chamber of Commerce. 904 East 6th Street, Corona, California, 92879. Uh, I'm here tonight, just I would like to do a shout out if I could to Dr. Ann Turner. I would like for her to just stand so people know who this quality person is. I wish Jason Lass was here and I wish that uh, Jose Correa and, and your entire team, what you guys put together Sunday on the lighting of City Hall, the historic center, to engage 10,000 plus people. It just was seamless, it was beautiful, and I just applaud you. I applaud you, Mr. Ellis, for bringing her on board, you, the council, for bringing Jacob on board, but what a wow factor, and I know there's some great plans in the future, but I just wanted to publicly say thank you, Dr. Turner. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Do we have any uh, anybody else? <laughs> <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ben Luke, 4116 Leicester. Uh, last meeting, I watched that uh, item on TV. And Wes, I want to tell you, it didn't look good. It looked like you either is attorney or either is business partner. I mean, why you have to file a, a request for waiver for a citizen and the rest of the citizen have to obey a different regulation. I own nine acre on Leicester. At a time I put, I enter into a, a lien agreement regarding the street improvement for $30,000. And later when I develop the property, it cost me over $200,000, okay, to put electricity on the ground, telephone, do the curb and gutter, sidewalk and whatever it take. So I think the rule for one is rule for all. It's not fair, okay? Now, I heard some excuse that people doesn't walk on that street. Of course they don't walk on that street because there's no sidewalk on that street. When it be a sidewalk, people will choose to go on either side of the road. There's a citizen here that came over, they live on Orange Heights, and, and he experienced high traffic of pedestrian walking on his side because on the other side there's no sidewalk. Now, if we want to be like Norco, everybody welcome to move and live in Norco. I mean, it's a high-end expensive neighborhood with five acre lot, very large home, okay? Why we need not to have, to, to have the, the street improvement? I heard some excuses regarding the gate and the elevation. Whoever did the grading over there is his responsibility to bring the grading to the right of way elevation. If they didn't do it right back then, I don't know if it's the, the, this owner or the previous owner, it's not the city fault. I experienced the same situation when I had to move my driveway and I have to move my gate. So I don't think it's the right direction to give people a waiver. You have a really nice way out just to enter into the lien agreement and whatever the, the, the city will be ready for it. Then they can choose is to do it or not. But to give him a waiver right now, you guys know what's going on on Leicester. When some of us did the street improvement and some of our old houses, okay, when we have like islands sticking to the street, and we don't know when, when that will take place. We might have to live another 20 years with no sidewalk and, and narrow street. So I think it's the opportunity right now to secure the option to have that street being developed, okay, and be proud of that street and not have one street with landscaping and sidewalk and curb and gutter and then the, the other street, even though there's the more expensive houses, but it, it doesn't look right. So I think, the, first of all, we need to remain with the base. The rule for one is rule for all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Edwards, do we have anybody else? Mayor, I do not have any more speaker cards. All right, so we're gonna go to public hearings. This, this is an uh, ordinance amending various chapters of Title 15 of the Corona Municipal Code and adopting reference, by reference, the 2022 Building Standards Code. Um, does any council member want a staff report on this item? <laughs> I, see, I see one, two, three, four no's. Okay, five no's. All right, so the public, all right, so I'll, uh, I will not ask uh, Ms. Coletta to uh, provide a report. So the public hearing is now open. Ms. Edwards, has the city clerk's office received any correspondence regarding this item? Mayor, we did not receive correspondence regarding the item. Ms. Edwards, have we received, received any speaker cards from the public? Mayor, we do not have any speaker cards. All right, this public hearing is now closed. Do I have any comments or questions? I'm seeing head shakes, great. So do I have a motion? for this item. I'll motion. Second. Okay, please vote. <clears throat> Drum roll. There we go, five zero. All right. Uh, this, uh, let's see, the next public hearing is ordinance amending Corona Municipal Code 3.02.080 to establish a 50% 50 50 reduction in planning and building and development services for nonprofit organizations and adding section 3.02.09 to establish a 50% reduction for plan check and permit inspection fees for a single family infill residential development within the downtown specific plan area. 
as well as Resolution 2022-118, revising the citywide master plan, master fee recovery schedule and recovery percentages to identify such reduced fees and to revise the public improvement plan check fee. Does any council member want a staff report on this item? I have questions, but sure. I don't need the staff report. You don't need a staff report? Okay. All right, the public hearing is now open. Ms. Edwards, has the city clerk's office received any correspondence regarding this item? Mayor, no, we did not. Um, have we received any speaker cards? Uh, yes, I have one speaker card for that. Okay. Item. Welcome. Good evening. Um, so I, I want to speak in support of this. Um, I think there was some confusion possibly at the last meeting where it seemed like we didn't want to, you know, it was, well, have we done this? Is this a weird thing? We do this all the time. We have graduated fee schedules for particular groups, um, you know, the, the uh, field use fees, you know, go from $2 an hour to $30 an hour, $25 an hour. Um, use fees at Circle City Center for, for all kinds of facilities in here. So if the, if the group, uh, I'm going to paraphrase it, but basically if the group is carrying on a, a duty that, that, you know, or some kind of, they're helping the city achieve the city's goals, the city names, then, you know, in a, in a sense it is a subsidy, you know, because they're doing the city's bidding. And I think these, these, uh, uh, these discounts are on the same line. They're, it's the same type of thing. So th these are furthering city goals, they're furthering strategic plan, plan goals. Uh, you know, they're doing, they're doing the city's bidding. So this is not anything, I think it's unusual, and I think it's probably long overdue. Um, you know, charging full pop to, you know, nonprofits, when they just literally have to turn around, when they're writing a check for one thing, they've got to go back and and get more money from somebody else. It's just, it's just a pass through, basically, and you know we're, the money isn't going to the services that need that need be. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> the public hearing Mayor, is now. I do have one oh, more speaker sorry, card one more. for this item. Go ahead. My apologies, uh, Bobby Spiegel, Corona Chamber. I really don't want to say that I'm going to agree with him, but I do agree. On, on this, so well, it may be the only time that that will ever happen in, in the history of Corona, but I do hope that, um, I think it's a great thing that you're doing for the nonprofits. At the same time, I do hope that you'll look at, and I have no idea on budgeting for the future, but if you could really increase manpower, local people to check plans, then furthermore, be able to get the turnaround time quicker I think that will solve a lot of problems, not just for nonprofits, but for the business community and for everyone. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, the public hearing is now closed. Uh, do I have any questions or comments from my colleagues? I have a question. Councilman Richens. Can, the, can this still be amended? Is it still possible to amend this? I guess it all depends on what you're amending exactly. It would be a little bit case specific to answer that. I can be. The uh, um, the Corona Heritage Museum, which is operates up by Foothill, but the property is owned by the city technically, right? I would like to amend it this proposal or whatever this is called to be that any building built on city property or property that could be reverted back to city property at a hundred percent plan check fees. I, I think it would count because they're a nonprofit. Yeah, but what I'm saying is instead of a 50% reduction, a hundred percent reduction for any building built on city property. Uh, I'm going to consult the city attorney on that. I think we'd need a little bit of time to work on that one. Yeah. Uh, but let me see. I think I'd want to to make sure I understand exactly what that would be and um, work on the language a little bit. Councilor Richards, is, is this something you think that we could we could approve this tonight and then come back at a future date and experiment? Because I think, I don't think the city owns it. I think there is a covenant that if the existing owner is, is a nonprofit, if they uh, fail to exist, if I remember right, 
If they fail to exist, the property will, will, will revert back to the city, but it is not, I, don't, I do not think it's owned by the city. That sounds right, but I'd need to confirm that. Yeah, it's a little more complicated. But I would want to complicate all that language into my proposal so that this project that's forthcoming can hit 100%. I'm just going to be honest. I can't announce the project, but so that this project can be 100% plan check. Do you think that would be something that could be better addressed as a, as a one-off versus as a blanket? Mayor, if I could interject on that, uh, there is a process available for individual waivers that might be appropriate for a specific project, if that's what you have in mind, rather than a carte blanche across the board rule. So that could be looked at on an individual basis. Maybe better off, better chance, just because it, it might throw some other things into into. Well, the, the problem is this one over here is going to say say that I'm not being fair. That's exactly what this one's going to say. Right? And so uh, so I'd rather talk about it now, but <laughs> if it's to your guys, if that's what you want, I, I'll, I'll just. I mean, you, you can certainly make a motion. It's your, it's your, it's your prerogative, too, okay. or you, okay. could, you could wait. It's your choice. I will, uh, as usual, forgo I ever had this conversation and uh, <laughs> make a motion to approve Number, I don't have to read this, do I? No. You do. <laughs> you know we, you know we bet before every. I, I actually put down an over under on which ones Tom's gonna ask the motion for. Sorry, would you get started, please? It's the part in blue, Tom. Did anybody want to second my motion? I'll or? second. Okay. All right. Here we go. This is criminal. <laughs> Introduced by title only and way full reading of ordinance number 3356, first reading of an ordinance of the City of Corona, California, amending Corona Municipal Code section 3.02.08.0 to establish a 50% reduction of building planning and development service fees for nonprofit organizations, adding section 3.02.090 to establish a 50% reduction for plan check and permit <coughs> slash inspection fees I need another Diet Coke. For single family infill residential development within the downtown specific plan and making certain other non substantive clarifications. Got it? Great. All right, please vote. I, I did. Just because it was funny. Okay, uh, we're on to administrative reports. Uh, this is a request for myself to have the City Council con in consider waiving construction of missing sidewalk improvements on the south side of Orange Heights between Main Street and Jasper. Uh, Roger Bradley, Assistant City Manager and Savat Kampu, Public Works Director, will introduce the item. Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, good evening. I'm Roger Bradley, Assistant City Manager. I'll just do a, a brief introduction and turn it over to Mr. Kampu, our Public Works Director, to do the bulk of the presentation. But just as a reminder, this is a continuation of an item from the November 2nd City Council meeting, uh, where the Council began a conversation about the uh, request to waive sidewalk improvements on the south side of Orange Heights between Main Street and Jasper Drive. This was made by the property owner of 234 Orange Heights. Um, at the, the meeting, there were several concerns that were uh, expressed that staff heard, and we tried to provide some uh, insight and research on those items, and Mr. Confu will uh, overview those as part of his presentation. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight. Um, Joanne's going to give me the um, working uh, PowerPoint. Thank you very much, Joanne. All right. All right. So the property owner on a 234 Orange Heights Lanes applied for a building permit and has requested through Vice Mayor Speak to waive the public improvements required for his permit. Okay. Um, just quickly going over what you have already seen at the last presentation, uh, Orange Heights Lanes is designated as a local street and the required right of way has been dedicated in the immediate area to support the residential development, which includes the public improvements. Uh, public improvements have been constructed on the north side and uh, along both sides on Orange Heights Lane beyond Jasper to the west and Main Street to the east. The remaining section of Orange Heights with missing public improvements were deferred by the previous city council. Um, just other property owners that have developed there um, that have developed there on that block have already 
secured costs for future construction and public improvements, and those are some properties that have been developed. You can kind of see that they're highlighted in green there. So the applicant's property on 234 Orange Heights Lane is a five-acre parcel with an existing 7,700-square-foot 7, home where the public improvements have not been constructed at the frontage of the property. The property owner wants to construct a new two-story two accessory building totaling approximately 11,600 square foot. Um, as required for his building permit, the applicant is required to construct public improvements such as sidewalks, street lights, curb and gutter, and the like. Uh, city staff have estimated this cost of the public improvements to be $46,691. The uh, Corona Municipal Code 15.48 governs offsite improvements associated with new construction. An ordinance intended to remedy deficiencies in safe street design throughout the city as improvements occur for the residences. Requirements for the public improvements that have been placed for this property owner's permits are no different than conditions placed on anyone uh, that develops in the city that come in and apply for a building permit. Again, the property owners are required to either construct the improvements or secure a uh, payment for improvements for uh, at a future time. The ordinance also makes provisions for the city council to waive or defer missing public improvements if certain conditions such as unnecessary hardship, exceptional circumstances that make it unfair or oppressive to the applicant and it will not adversely affect the public health and safety um, of the public. As mentioned, the item was deferred to today's meetings to provide time for staff to address some of the concerns expressed uh, from the November 7th meeting. Here's a summary of what um, um, those concerns and I'm gonna go into detail uh, in uh, one by one. So the estimated um, construction cost of $46,690,000 does not include reconstruction of driveways, uh, gates, or undergrounding of power poles, and the actual construction costs may be higher. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just go through all this so you can, didn't realize that it was all there. So the estimated construction costs only includes costs for work in the public right-of-way, such as the driveway approaches, um, sidewalks, and streetlights. It does not include any improvements or modifications to the private property, such as the driveway, uh, gate, and fence that are within private property. The property owner would benefit to pay the estimated amount up to the front uh, for work, up front for work in the public right of way because it would relieve him from his obligation to construct the public improvements. And at a future date, uh, when the city performs the work all at one, all in one time, it would then be the, respon the responsible cost would be towards the city to construct um, any work in the public right of way, including um, any modifications to the private property if necessary. Okay. Sorry about that. The other concern was um, the cost of the property owner to the property does not include undergrounding of the power poles. Again, uh, per Corona Municipal Code Section 1560, it's a separate topic under the undergrounding of, of wires um, or power poles within the city. The applicant is required to underground utility poles as a condition of approval for this project. However, per the uh, section under this topic, the applicant can apply for a waiver should uh, the requirement be unreasonable, impractical, impractical, and cause undue hardship to the applicant. Uh, based upon the um, similar Southern California Edison undergrounding project, the estimated cost to underground the power poles and the facilities uh, range from about up to $40,000 per pole to underground. Now, there are a total of 10 poles on this block on the south side of Orange Heights with a capacity of about 12 kilovolts. Staff understands that the undergrounding of one pole in front of the applicant, applicant's property is unreasonable, and there, there are adjacent poles that will still be left standing that would not resolve the aesthetic field of the neighborhood. Um, again, the applicant has been informed of the process and uh, fees to apply for the waiver. The third item that we're talking about is that utility lines and poles conflict with sidewalks and streetlights. Uh, there is a 24 foot, I have a little diagram up there. We actually went out to the site and took some pictures. There's a, a 24 foot public right of way between the curb and the property line, more than sufficient right of way for a sidewalk. It may be designed to, it can be designed to meander, follow existing grades, and around the power pole to minimize any impacts to the existing landscaping. Uh, there also appears to be sufficient vertical clearances under the utility lines to install a streetlight. 
However, if there is not su um, sufficient vertical clearances, um, there's an opportunity to actually install a street light on the power pole itself with Southern California Edison. Uh, one of the, the other concern was that the grade drops are um, excessive, um, uh, is excessive, and it may require excess grading, uh, major modifications to the driveway or fence and great mo gate modification. Um, the four to five feet drop spans a horizontal distance of 24 feet from the, uh, from the curb and uh, the property line, and another 18 feet to the property fence. Um, the slope appears to be gradual and therefore constructing a four foot minimum sidewalk should not really have a significant impact along the frontage. The sidewalk can either meander, be uh, adjacent to the curb following existing grades, similar to a trail and kind of go around the power pole as necessary to avoid trees and landscaping as well. Um, I went out there to the, the site and there's actually um, a 10 foot sidewalk on Chase between Main Street and Gerritsen. Uh, the drop is actually six feet or more, and it's only 30 foot. So it is possible to construct a sidewalk um, along grades. And that is an extreme case. This, the, this case is more gradual. <laughs> so the other concern was uh, other streets like Gilbert and Gerritsen between Santana Way and Pacific Road have limited or no sidewalks. Properties along this and other like streets have constructed improvements such as accessory dwelling units, but they were not required to build sidewalks. Um, the um, Corona Municipal Code Chapter 15.48 does govern the offsite improvements <coughs> related to new constructions with the exception of ADUs. Um, the ADUs are regulated by the state. And so as much as I would love to implement it with ADUs, unfortunately, we're trying to um, um, the ADUs follow a different set of rules, so therefore that's why the exception is there. Um, again, development, um, development or private improvements with the exception of ADUs along these streets with missing public improvements are conditioned to construct, pay their fair share for future, or pay their fair share for future construction of the improvements in order to obtain a building permit. Um, the options were presented last time as well. Option one was really to direct staff to um, um, up, apply for or, or f have findings in order to be able to waive the applicant um, for these considerations of, of public improvements. The pros are there. It does lower the cost of the constructions for the current and future development of this area. And the cons is that the public improvements would not be built consistent with other areas in the community. And it would actually set um, it potentially creates precedence for uh, waiving or installing public improvements in other areas of the community. Again, as uh, mentioned by the uh, public comment earlier. The other option is what the city, uh, what, what staff is recommending. It's, it's directing staff to implement the required uh, requirements of the Corona Municipal Code, Municipal Code, have the public improvements adjacent to 234 Orange Heights Lane be deferred, have the property owner pay for the estimated construction cost of the public improvements, and have the property owner pay for the cost upfront for the improvements with the city building the improvements at an appropriate future date and time. Uh, the pros are that it provides for a complete um, provides for the funding to complete the public improvements one time along the south side of the section of Orange Heights at a future date. And the cons, it does, it does increase the cost of the development for the resident uh, should he uh, develop on his property. Staff recommends option two, as I, as I just had mentioned and summarized in the, uh, the bullet points there. And um, <clears throat> here was the ask at the beginning of the presentation, and uh, we are here to answer any questions. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Edwards, are, we, are there any speaker cards from the public on this item? Mayor, yes, we have three speaker cards. Okay, come on down. Good evening again. I just want to clarify something. I was outside earlier and I've been called in and I thought I'm speaking on that item. So there's no reason for me to repeat it, okay. but I want to uh, uh, ask something else. I have another item for communication. I will allow to speak another now or later on different item, communication. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Why not? I, I should have caught you before, but you were on a roll and I didn't yes. want to stop you. Okay. Go, go ahead. 
Anyway, I, uh, good, good evening again. Uh, I live on Leicester uh, Avenue, and uh, next door to me, there's a site that previously used to be a nursery. About three months ago, they started bringing a vehicle over there, and I believe is a Sunset, something Sunset company here in town. And I complained to the code enforcement, and it didn't help. Back then when I complained, it was about 60 vehicles. Now there's over 120 vehicles. Can I use that projection? Can you help me out? So anyway, the, the site is a 10-acre undeveloped property. It's a dirt. There's 120 vehicles. You can see this is what I see from my backyard. I, I'm, I feel like I'm living on, on a dealership. Okay, this is what I see from the backyard every day. Every morning at 7 o'clock, okay, vehicle coming in, vehicle going out. It's, as I say, it's undeveloped site. It's a dirt. When it's raining, they're dragging mud to the street. I don't know about the concern about cont uh, contamination, oil, gas, or whatever, or if homelessness will enter over there and, and burn one car and the whole thing will be on fire. And, and I don't know why it takes the city over three months to stop local business in town from violating the law. It's a residential area. Now, when, uh, in, in general, when you complain to the code enforcement, that's it. They will not give you no more information about update, what's going on, what the process. Okay, and, and, and those guys just doing whatever they want. It it's cannot happen then somebody complain, but you, your hand is tied by just sending a notice to the owner of the property, but the business continue to bring cars and doing like whatever they want. It has to be some kind of legal power to the city to stop them from bringing cars and then taking the legal uh, option to clear all this vehicle. I mean, it's really not, not pleasure to be a C120 vehicle in a residential area. So please, if somebody can answer what can be done, uh, the rest of the neighbor like to know that too. I, I think I can, I can tell you that there is an active code enforcement case. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much I can share past that, but I, I can, I'll give you a, a call afterward and I can okay. give I'll you some additional information. But I, I know that we are trying to get them in compliance. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Welcome. Um, my name is Henry Ramon, and I wanted to bring up uh, two issues that are connected. Um, and the first one is the Orange Heights uh, issue. Um, the five-acre homes across from the one acre where I have a home, um, it looks like a rural uh, area. The, 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 the poles the unimproved sidewalk, uh, it just doesn't live up to expectation for that street. And it, it should be improved because on my side, there is increased um, traffic because people can't walk on the dirt. And I think um, the rule should be fair and equitable for both sides. Both, both sides should be improved. Um, these are multi-million dollar homes, and uh, one side is being uh, treated like a residential, and the other side looks like a rural area, and, and that's not right. We're paying enough taxes where both sides should be symmetrical. Um, the other issue that I wanted to bring up was the corner of Leicester and Upper. I, have a, uh, I was part of the Griffin... Uh, residential improvement for that street and I remember distinctly that uh, we had to improve that that subdivision everything had to be done underground uh, sidewalks you name it uh, in fact I remember uh, Tom Coper would not uh, allow us to continue with that development unless we removed a kink in the road on Leicester which I owned uh, it cost me about $150,000 just for that improvement. And here is uh, a gentleman that's looking to improve his lot. And um, we're kind of looking the other way and saying that it's not needed. So I think um, what's fair and equitable should be spread for everybody. Um, so I don't think there should be any favoritism here. Um, Again, 
when I was involved with um, Griffin Residential, there was no option. There was no bonds uh, offered to us. There was uh, no concessions, no hardship, nothing. We were, we were told, you either do that or you can't continue. And we had to suck it up and, and put up a lot of money to develop that, uh, about 25 homes. And I, I think that was the right thing to do, but also what makes it right is that should be applied to anybody that wants to improve, uh, especially a five acre residential lot where the homes are in excess of three, $4 million. Okay. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome. Good evening again. So my friend and I went up there and took a look at this lot because I was thinking that there was going to be some kind of really horrible uh, deal to build. And I saw how much room there was and just how easy it would have been to build it. It's really an insignificant issue. You know, when he's talking about, well, I might have to do 20 feet of concrete. It's not even a truck. You know, it's not even not even 10 yards of concrete to pour the con pour the whatever he might have to do in order to meet whatever grade, it's pretty insignificant. And so, you know, I, I get, as far as the undergrounding of the utilities and being on them, I, I see those waved all the time here. You know, that that's a thing that happens in here. If that's gonna be, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars to underground the utilities there, you know, we do, we've, we've waived those or had other grants and funds and everything to get those done if they needed to. So that's something that can definitely be worked around. But not putting a sidewalk up there, not not wanting to do the, just the most basic public improvements that everybody's obligated to do and pay for, every single development in the city is obligated by plan. If it's built today, you're paying for them. Nobody else gets that waiver. Especially not, it's in the plans already. It's already supposed to be there. You heard from two people that have already paid lots and lots of money to do the same thing on their properties. So, you know, not to mention Ontario. You know, the, the residents on Ontario who would love to have that extra six or 10 or 14 feet of buffer between them and the street. You know, so this is not that different from the Ontario project. So, you know, they would love to uh, not have the sidewalk have a little bit more buffer. You see, you see, I see, you see a quizzical look on your face. It's, it's, it's similar. We're in, we're obligated. We're, uh, we're basically building with a lot less room on Ontario than this gentleman has. And so, and also at the previous meeting, we just discussed how to build a house, to build a 3,500 square foot house. The fees were in the 80 to $105,000 range. So, and this guy's complaining about the 46,000. So I would say, why not just build it now? You have, you have money or liens for half of these houses. Why not just build it now and encumber any further, any future development? You could lock in the cost. It's gonna end up costing them less if you do it now than it would be if you waited and waited and waited and who knows what the concrete price is gonna be in 2050. And you could have the public improvements now. You have almost all the money. And it wouldn't be like we're spending the money, we're just, we're spending it up front for a future, you know, for, we're going to recover it in the future. Somebody's going to be building on those lots, somebody's going to be obligated to do it, and they're probably going to be more likely to do it if they weren't, uh, if you had the proper public improvements, because it would be a nicer street. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Edwards, do we have any other speaker cards? Mayor, no, we do not. Okay, so I'll bring it back to my colleagues. Do you have any comments or questions? Councilmember Casillas? Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Savat, just a couple of questions. So you went out and assessed the, the distance. And so am I to understand correctly that, in fact, the fence will not have to be moved and uh, a new driveway would not have to be constructed in order to meet the requirements for a sidewalk? Correct. Okay. Um, you know, and I was wondering, it came to my attention, um, is, does this property owner also own another home on the same block? Do we know? I can't verify that. Okay. Um, okay. Lastly, so it, it, what is, I mean, I stand by where I stood last time, right? The owner has options. The owner can either pay up front now to build their, um, 11,000 square foot garage, or they can 
have a lien placed on their property um, to pay this whenever it's ready to be built. Um, so I'm, I'm still not in favor of, you know, the, uh, the waiver. But what I'd like to pursue, um, Mr. Ellis, is a future agenda item uh, where these one-off waivers, um, you know, can face more scrutiny before they come before us for a, count, for a vote. I just, I, I don't think it should be subject to a vote in this way. If it is, uh, um, if it is applicable to all owners in the city, then it should be applicable to all owners, and it shouldn't be whether or not a council member can bring before a council a vote for a waiver. So I'd like a future agenda item where we can have that discussion. Thank you, Mayor, or uh, Council Member Casillas, we can do that. Okay, thank you. Council Member Richens. Yeah, I'd just like to make a couple comments. Um, I, I, it's nerve wracking as a council member to put up an agenda like this. And it's, uh, cause you don't know how it's gonna go. And I think we know how this one's gonna go. <laughs> but uh, it, there is something to be admirable of a council member representing a citizen. And it's even more cool really that it's all done in the open and you, what you've seen tonight is transparency and you see it, you see citizens assemble, you have comments, you get, we got a more informed um, presentation. For example, I didn't know that there is already liens placed on some of the properties and that's a big influencer for me. So I, I just wanna say thank you to one and all for that's involved. Some people are gonna be heartbroken tonight, some people are gonna be happy, but the process and the system worked and I'm very happy about that. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Steiner. Yes, yeah, Savat, thank you for addressing the concerns that came up at the last meeting. I am also supportive of option two to maintain <laughs> consistency. Okay. Vice Mayor. Yep. Thank you. Um, Director Kampu, can you help clarify something for me? I was, uh, I misunderstood or I don't quite understand the undergrounding of the poles. You said that there's 10 poles on the street and is this applicant on the hook for undergrounding all 10 poles or would they just be on the hook for the one in front of their property? Just the one in front of their property. So because, because there isn't a plan currently to underground those poles, they wouldn't just underground one pole. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. That was the only clar uh, clarifying question that I had. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Kampu, I, I appreciate you going out and spending the extra time. Um, my understanding and, and was that, that there was gonna have to be substantial changes to their driveway and their gate. Uh, thank you for going and verifying that. So I, I'm not in favor of, of uh, issuing a waiver for this project. So, um, and if we need, I guess we can make a motion to, to recommend option number two. I'll make the motion for option number two. And I'll second. Okay, please vote. Thank you. I want to thank um, Council Member Steiner for, for really pushing for this uh, delay so we can go out and, and do the additional additional homework on this to, to make the right decision. And um, I, I just want to be to clarify um, that this this waiver was not for just a specific property. It was for um, a change in the, in the way the street was classified because not every street in the city is required to have a sidewalk like in on Duncan and other cities, other streets that were mentioned. So this isn't necessarily a um, uh, singling out of this specific um, owner, it was really a, an idea to look at the entire street. So, okay, so with that, we'll go on to item number 29, which is a blue zone community assessment. And uh, Roger Bradley, assistant city manager, will introduce the item. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, good evening again. Um, I had the pleasure of presenting this, uh, present the presentation this evening, and early starting it off. Uh, sorry, excuse me one second. 
Um, I want to say to start off that I want to thank Mr. Justin Tucker, uh, who put a lot of uh, work and effort into preparing this presentation this evening. Unfortunately, he was not able to be here. Uh, I get the pinch hit for him. But uh, I did want to give him credit and say thank you for his hard work on this item. Uh, tonight we're looking at blue zones. Uh, blue zones, uh, for those who are, may not have heard that term before, uh, are areas within the world where people ha live healthier and live longer. It just so happens that we've had have one of those areas here in our region, Loma Linda. Um, we've been, or there have been studies done on blue zones, and they've looked at different uh, ways and demographics that contribute to the longevity of the people in those areas. And they tried to um, use that model on different communities in, in the world and country to help uh, prove the health of the people that live there. And we have been asked whether we'd like to be a community that would be assessed for, for blue zone longevity and find things uh, that we could educate our community on to help improve our health and improve our longevity. I have Dr. Sang here this evening who will lead us through the bulk of this presentation and discuss that in more detail. And at the end, I'll take over and talk a little bit about uh, the pros and cons of, of this option, of this, uh, of this effort. And uh, the ask this evening will be, uh, does the council wish to have staff facilitate a community assessment for a potential blue zone project in the city of Corona? And if it pleases the council, I will turn the time over to Dr. Tseng. Are you okay this evening? Okay, thank you. You know, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Bradley and I'd like to thank the mayor and the city council for allowing me to be here tonight to speak to you about this very exciting ask. Um, uh, you know, just to introduce myself, my name is Shanling Sang. I am a family physician by training, and um, I am also our deputy public health officer here in Riverside County. And as you know, Riverside County is one of the fastest growing counties in California. And this gives us a unique opportunity to partner with communities and plan together on how we want to shape the health of Riverside County and how we can make healthy choices the easy choice. And, you know, in doing that, Riverside County Public Health has partnered with the Blue Zones Initiative. Um, and what we're hoping is that we can uh, come together tonight and ask to partner with the city of Corona as well as we think about this feasibility assessment. So let me share with you a little bit about the Blue Zones Initiative. Right now, uh, the Blue Zones Initiative is active in 71 communities across 14 states in, in the nation. And you can see up and down California, the Adventist Health System has actually partnered with all of their different hospitals in California to create Blue Zones communities around their hospitals. So, so what is Blue Zones? Um, some of you may have read in the National Geographic's uh, research that was published in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, where it's backed by research of the original blue zones where they found these spots throughout the world where people thrive into their hundreds and where people live longer and they live better high quality life. Um, and really the blue zones initiative is trying to figure out how they can bottle that and optimize the human made surroundings for sustainable well-being improvements and think about how do we do that with all of our communities here when we're not currently in a blue zone spa uh, space. So if you look, there are five currently identified um, blue zones in the world. And Mr. Bradley mentioned Loma Linda, California, which is right in our backyard. And um, what these blue zones have in common are nine things that they've characterized, the blue zones team has characterized into something called the power nine. And it's really looking at how do we move naturally? Not so much go to the gym and exercise, but how do we move naturally in our community, in our uh, everyday uh, life? And what is our outlook in life? What is our purpose? How do we downshift? How do we come out of our everyday work and downshift? How do we eat wisely? So thinking about the 80% rule, thinking about uh, what that means is that you don't eat until you're full, but you eat until you're about 80% full. Also thinking about what we eat. So having a plant slant, which means you know, eating less meat, more vegetables, more things that are produced naturally. And then wine is actually something that was found to be a common thing in our Blue Zones communities where they enjoyed wine. Um, and really thinking about what connects us to our community. So if we look at our community, who are the people we like to associate with? Our loved ones come first. 
thinking about how do we belong to our communities. And those things are um, characteristics that they call the power nine. The blue zone solution model is really a systematic way of how we think about our communities. As you may know, research shows that where we live has a bigger influence on our health than our genetics. And the Blue Zones model shows that we spend 90% of our lives within 20 miles of our home. And this is what they call the life radius. And so really focusing on the people, the places, and the policy of where we live and how do we influence that to make healthy choices the easiest choice is what we're looking to do with partnership around the feasibility assessment for transformation into Blue Zones communities. And the process itself consists of three phases. And the first phase is what we're presenting tonight, um, is that accessibility, the feasibility assessment, um, where we look at the readiness of a community. We partner with our Blue Zones team and our public health team to provide expert guidance around that feasibility assessment. And then take that information back and leverage the Blue Zones team and their research arm, which includes Gallup Wellbeing Index, as well as Oxford Research, to then create a plan together around what that, might, that transformation may look like for the city of Corona. After the feasibility assessment, the next phases would be something we would come back and discuss, which would include an activation phase with the eventual hope that we can move into a transformation phase where we can leverage the uh, strengths and the um, plan that was put together to move hopefully the community into that transformation phase where we can make healthy choice the easy choice, where we think about our built environment, our food systems, our schools, our civic and faith uh, uh, communities, and how do we do that work together to find out, um, to transform our community and find the best way to make, again, the healthy choice those easy choices. So why do we think about blue zones? So public health you know, has an ambitious goal of trying to make our community and our county the healthiest county in the nation. And with that, we were trying to figure out how do we measure that? You know, how do we move our communities to become the center of health and to really leverage research and evidence-based um, uh, structures and systematic change to get there? So the Blue Zones has some pretty impressive outcomes. And so I'm, I'm sharing some with you here on the screen. So Albert Lee, which is in Minnesota, it's a small community, um, they did a transformation project over 13 years. And what they found was a 49% decrease in medical claims for costs, um, medical claims costs for city workers. And they added 2.9 years to the lifespan of those living in that community. Their uh, healthy index jumped from 34th place in Minnesota um, to, from uh, where they were at 68th, um, I apologize, where they were at 68 before out of 87 uh, counties within Minnesota. So that's a big change if you went from 68 to 34th. And we were thinking, wow, there's, there's something there. The Blue Zones team has also come to the beach cities in California. And in their 10 years of work there, they were able to show a 55% drop in childhood obesity. That is very significant as you think about how that impacts our future and our kids' future as they go into adulthood. Um, same with Fort Worth, Texas. They saw a 31% decrease in smoking, which equals a $20 billion lifetime reduction um, in smoking, uh, uh, poor outcomes from smoking. And so, you know, with that, we saw that they were able to sustain well-being in the communities that they work in. And right now, as I share, they're in 71 communities. So today we're here to ask you about um, if we can partner together to move into phase one, which is the readiness assessment. And this is where part, uh, public health and the Blue Zones team will partner with you as a city in looking at performing a structured exploration of your community and collaborate to build a plan for change. So what does that change look like? So we've been doing some planning and prep meetings with your um, city manager and city leadership. And we did a community-led presentation where we learned a little bit more about your city. And we were very impressed by what we saw. 
And uh, we're moving into these one-to-one -one interviews and really then asking for the next steps from there. So uh, if we were to get the go-ahead to please um, you know, move forward with this Blue Zones assessment, we would then come into the community and do focus groups and really engage your community leaders to better understand how we could work together again collaboratively with what's already existing and to build on that and to propose a plan for, again, moving together forward towards transformation projects. So with that, I'm gonna turn this back to Mr. Bradley. And Thank you. Um, so again, th this evening we are asking the council if there's interest in proceeding with a community assessment uh, along the Blue Zones uh, model. Um, that's the only, op the only item that we're looking to commit to. There are uh, uh, items after that, which we would be able to look at as they become available to us. But for the uh, pros and cons of doing the community assessment, really it's an opportunity to engage the community, to activate them in, in, around the issue of wellness and health, and evaluate ways to improve the quality of life in the, in the community. So those are the pros. It is aligned with our uh, strategic plan goals of sound infrastructure and a sense of place. And the uh, Riverside University Health System is bearing the cost of that assessment. There is, however, some staff time that we expect to uh, have to, uh, to use to help with this effort. Um, on the, the other side, if we were not to uh, participate, of course, there would be no staff time for helping to coordinate it. However, it could potentially be a missed opportunity to engage the community around this issue of health and wellness. And again, this evening, we're... Wrong button. This again this evening we're looking for direction on whether to uh, continue with this project and do a community assessment for a potential blue zone project here in the city of Corona. And that concludes our report and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Edwards, are there any speaker cards from the public? Mayor, yes, I have one speaker card for this item. Okay, come on down. Maybe two. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome. Good evening. My name is Cheryl Lum. I live in Corona. And I'm thrilled to hear about this as a possibility for Corona. Uh, I started reading the Blue Zone book uh, in January, and it has improved my life. Now, at the age of almost 72, I don't really expect to live to be 100, but the Blue Zone does improve our lives. Uh, I've lost weight. I've um, looked into ways for managing stress. I highly highly encourage us to look at this for our community. It will help the community. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi again. This is about the spot you're tired of hearing about from me. Um, I don't know any about this thing scientifically about this stuff, but coincidentally, as I was listening to this person speak on it, it reminded me that over time, from time to time, I will, if I got time to waste, I will sort of Google up lists of states that have certain characteristics, like which states have the highest and lowest levels of education, which states have the worst and the best roads, all these sorts of things, which states have the highest rates and lowest rates of teen pregnancies, whatever, a bunch of things. And you start to build up maps and lists of states. And one of the things that keeps coming up is where people are healthy or not healthy. And goodness sakes, those states where people are, generally speaking, not as healthy, have a lot of other characteristics. And I'm not going to get into all those in commonality because we'd be here all night arguing about that. But uh, this blue zone thing seems to fit with that. And I knew nothing about this. I was just back there listening, and it just reminded me of these times that I've done that sort of stuff on my own. So I think there's probably some validity in this, and it doesn't look like it's going to cost a whole bunch. So I will put my vote in with those folks that want to do this that can't hurt. I can see that it might possibly help, and uh, that's all. It can't. And I'm 78, so I don't have a whole lot of miles left but I'd like to make the rest of them as good as possible. And I still drive a car with a clutch pedal. So um, that's all. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Good evening. I had a couple of questions that came in from uh, people online about other cities in the county that have been approached on this, and if there's other cities that are 
are participating in this program, or, or we're the only one that's been, you know, just kind of wondering what the, what the rest of the crowd has been or what their response has been. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Ellis? Mayor, I can respond to that. There's six communities total in Riverside County that are, uh, I believe, will be participating. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I go to my colleagues, Councilmember Casillas. Yes, thank you. Um, I just have just two quick questions. Ultimately, I'm in favor. I, I agree. I don't see how this can do us harm. Uh, the only two things that I that I wonder is one is I, whenever these things come out, really I wonder what we're trying to do here is trying to have a culture shift, right? A, like a community culture shift. And so it makes me curious about the communities where these shifts have worked. Um, if there is some sort of X factor that is difficult to replicate, you know, do they have just lovely weather? Do they have access to things that are just, um, you know, non-transferable, non-replicable in other cities? Just so, like Corona. you it's know, Corona. <laughs> but we're a great city, um, which leads me to point number two. Um, we've been tapping on our community a lot recently. Uh, for our strategic plan, for our downtown uh, plan, for our economic development, for our communications. Like, we've been tapping into them a lot. And so, um, you know, I have heard a little bit of rumbling about, like, you know, not, not engagement fatigue, but for lack of a better word, of survey, 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 right? So um, I wonder if uh, there can be further communication, further conversations with staff and the Blue Zone team about being really intentional about the community engagement. Um, there's probably groups that um, would engage uh, rather easily and that we have a captive you know, list. Um, I'm thinking about the, the hikers that have helped us with the open space communication and, and the trails master plan because you know, living in the community. And so, Wondering about being really intentional about engaging those folks and not just spamming our community with another survey because there there will become confusion about what it is that we're asking folks to do. So, just my thoughts. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Richens. <clears throat> I don't know. Um, you had me until you mentioned vegetables, and then you kind of. <laughs> I'm not ready to retreat from meat, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, um, I'm really not the person to talk to about See, but this. But it's not about you though. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think anybody here wants to eat vegetables. But um, it's all good if Fuller's with it. And okay. I'm, I'm down with it and I'll just leave it, although I don't like vegetables. Got it. So. Duly noted, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Steiner. Yeah, so reading this agenda was the first time I'd heard about this, so I'm kind of with Don. I think that uh, it, it couldn't hurt. It may help. Why not give it a try? Okay. Vice Mayor, I can already tell where this is going, but go ahead. I can't. I almost find it hard <laughs> to believe that I'm the only person up here that actually knew about Blue Zones. I saw a documentary six, seven years ago, mostly because I was impressed that Loma Linda yeah. was a blue zone and then when you find out why um i'm also not on the vegetable train um i probably need help in all nine of those areas um keenly interested to hear more about wine time and um <laughs> and how to reduce stress that seems to be a common theme up on this dais as well um including council member steiner's bag of candy over there which i'm sure is <laughs> That's the small bag, folks. There's a much bigger. <laughs> there's a much. There's a much bigger bag that goes along with that. Um, but I, I actually think this is wonderful. I mean, Corona's a great community, and I want to see not only Mr. Fuller live to be 105, but continue to drive a clutch until he's 105. And and I want to see you know uh, good health I, as the as the picture of good health up on this dais, which goes to the city manager. Um, I, I think this would be a, a, a great opportunity. I'd love to hear more, and I'd love to find out what could um, improve the life and health of our Corona residents. So I'm all for it. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming, and thank you for the presentation. I, I, I firmly believe that you have to have a plan 
Um, even if you don't know where you're going, I mean, we have an idea where we're going, where we want to go, um, but if you don't put a stake in the ground, you can't get there. So to me, this is um, a wonderful opportunity. I think that staff is very aware, and I think that um, Councilmember Casillas brings up a really good point. The staff is keenly aware of, of uh, where we are in, in the, our um, uh, sense of, of you know, capturing our residents' ideas, and I, I trust that they will not overtax our, our folks. So I see this as a very positive um, uh, step for us to take. And uh, though I'm, I'm not a big vegetable eater, um, I, uh, I, I do see the benefit of every single one of those, those items in that blue zone. So I'm looking forward to uh, learning more and seeing how um, we can incorporate those uh, or figure out how we can incorporate some of those in our community. So thank you for coming and thank you for the opportunity. Um, so I'm assuming that we sound like we have five thumbs up. Good. Councilmember Casillas is kind of a sideways thumb. Are you? Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So are we uh, good there, Mr. Ellis? Thank you, Mayor. That's the direction we needed. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So on to administrative report, approved professional services funding and lease agreements with Mercy House Living Centers and the Second Amendment, Second Amended Partner Agency Agreement with Path of Life Ministries and the Eleventh Amendment to the Maintenance and General Services Agreement with Security Defense. Uh, Karen Roper, our Homeless Solutions Manager, will present the item. I see you have your troops here. Good evening, honorable council members. Uh, Karen Roper, Homeless Solutions Manager. What do we usually do before Karen Roper presents? Put your seat belts on. <laughs> is there, is there a dis can we get a disclaimer for when Ms. Roper, <laughs> Ms. Roper is about ready to present? Folks, if you're in the audience, hold on. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a ride right now. First, that's a, stretching is important. So tonight I am elated to present before your council our fiscal year 23 homeless system of services agreements. What, before I get started, I wanted to um, bring some inspiration that actually came from a cool conversation with Dr. Turner. When uh, we were talking about the homeless strategic plan and the culmination of this effort all coming together, and after I talked to Dr. Turner, I had a chance to talk to our wonderful Jessica, who's the uh, head of our economic development department, about how the city of Corona develops. We have a number of different plans that you can see before you. Our citywide strategic plan, city park master plan, parks and rec master plan, downtown revitalization plan, economic development strategic plan, trails master plan, general plan, and of course the homeless strategic plan. And some might think, oh my goodness, just government creating all of these plans that are gonna sit and collect dust on a shelf, but that is certainly not the city of Corona. We are serious about execution. And what is so important, and uh, Dr. Turner, you said this and you inspired the heck out of me, that for, let's say, the Parks and Rec Master Plan or the City Park Master Plan or the Downtown Revitalization Plan, how critical the homeless system of services and the homeless strategic plan are to the success of those plans. They are interlinked together and they cannot be successful without one another. So thank you, Dr. Turner, for that, um, that moment of inspiration that I stole from you for my presentation. <laughs> I wanted to, uh, for your benefit, take you back down memory lane about the goals in our homeless strategic plan and to tell you that the homeless system of services that is before your council tonight is going to fulfill goal number one, systems-oriented approach. Goal number two, low barrier emergency shelter and navigation center. Goal number three, development of permanent supportive housing and affordable housing solutions. Goal number six, public-private partnerships. And goal number eight, uh, homeless prevention, because some of the funds do uh, provide for that, which I'll talk about. That we have different measures when we're looking at the success of the strategic plan. Tonight, we're just focusing on systems measures because you're considering approval of the homeless system of services. So you can see a number of things that we look to measure, the shelter beds, the housing units, supportive services, public-private partnerships, 
regional partnerships, and of course grants. And all of those are interwoven into what uh, we have. Before I dive into the components of the homeless system of services contracts, I wanted to give you an update on our uh, emergency shelter construction. I'd like to uh, thank so much uh, Tom Moody and AFTAB and the team that have been working uh, with the contractor to really move phase one and phase two along. You may recall that we had some leftover items from phase one regarding ADA compliance. And then you approved phase two, I believe in April. And thank you, you approved $3 million to transform this emergency shelter into a, a beautiful, innovative, robust shelter navigation center. So phase one is completed and we hope that phase two is gonna be done by the end of this month. And you can see some of the big ticket items that have taken a lot of time are those ramps. We had to do a lot of ADA improvements for all of four of the ramps inside of the kitchen, inside of the bathrooms. And then of course, we've been working on all of the exciting clinic improvements. And I know we have our CEO from Central Medical Community Clinic who is here tonight. So we hope to finish in December, except for the generator, supply chain issues, 16 weeks out maybe so. In March, April, hopefully we'll have it, but we're gonna open without it. And uh, thanks to all the support from Joanne and her department, we have a certificate of occupancy. So we, the shelter will open, even though we don't have the generator. So, but the generator will be nice, right? Because we have people there 24 seven, we're gonna have a lot of food, so we need a backup plan if we lose power, right? Okay, let's talk about the components of the agreements before your council tonight. The first is the Mercy House Agreement, and it's 3.9 million, but some might think a shelter, no, this is a system. This is a 40 bed shelter that includes 30 beds for males, five beds for single adult females, five post-hospital recuperative care beds. It also includes uh, a pilot transportation uh, meal program to be able to partner with the faith community to move meal serving out of our parks, get our homeless clients to a place where they can actually have some dignity, get connected to services, and maybe get interested in getting some medical uh, services at the clinic, maybe might wanna stay at the shelter, and because we're infusing housing, there will be a path to housing. And on top of that, of course, we do have 12 units of permanent supportive housing. We're actually converting transitional housing units that we have into permanent supportive housing. And then also we have $1.1 million in home funding that we will use for rental assistance for housing placements and homeless prevention. Also, I'm gonna talk about a security defense contract because we've needed security at the shelter site. And then of course, uh, some recommendations regarding the path of life contract. How's my speed for you so far? Okay, your seatbelt's okay? All right, so let's talk about the RFP process for the Mercy House Homeless System of Services. So we did our traditional advertising in the Sentinel Weekly, Planet Bids, I think that's like 700 and 30 registered, non-registered vendors. And then we also worked with the county staff who are here tonight from Housing and Workforce Services to distribute it to the entire continuum of care to advertise it. That's over 524 different uh, people representing all of our nonprofit shelter, housing, service, cities, county agencies, education, it's huge. So we released the RFP on June the 1st. And then we had three nonprofits that responded and came to the mandatory pre-proposal conference on one day and then on another day they, they came and attended the site visits at both the Harrison Shelter and the 12 units of housing. We, uh, one of those organizations is Path of Life who we have a partnership with, they're a great partner, but at this particular time in their agency's history, their CEO indicated that due to changes in staff and just where they are capacity wise, because this is a whole system, they declined to submit a proposal. Another organization that uh, did come to the conference and the walkthrough was Holidays Helping Hands. They are out of Los Angeles County and they missed the deadline to submit the proposal. So we received one responsive proposal from Mercy House uh, Living Centers. They went through a, a, a detailed threshold review and passed threshold review for uh, compliance with all the components in the RFP and were passed on to an evaluation committee. That evaluation committee, we have one of the representatives here with us tonight from the county. Um, she will be making some comments. 
along with myself and um, Cynthia, to review the proposals with different um, perspectives of expertise in homeless shelter, affordable housing, and systems of care. So the evaluation committee average score uh, was 111 out of 120 possible points. Normally you might see 100 points score, right? But we added 10 points for an interview because the committee felt it was important to interview the, the agencies. And also points for project readiness, like how quick they could mobilize. The scores, you have the spreadsheet of all of the evaluators' scores. You will see that they are tight, they are very close together, and that is a good sign that it's a strong proposal and a good committee that knows what they're doing and they review it independently and then their scores are very similar. So a really strong proposal process. So let's talk about some of the components of the agreement. One of the things that is uh, requested from your council is to approve a two month operational and capital advance. The capital advances for furniture equipment um, and other supplies that are needed because we need to get the shelter ready to be able to have residents. And then two months worth of operation. This is very common. Mercy House is in over 67 different cities. There's a reason why they're in 67 different cities, but when you work with that many government agencies that have all different types of uh, payment processes and you're trying to bring on a whole entire system, they need to have cash flow. So this was uh, uh, critical to their uh, accepting and uh, uh, will, being willing to contract with us. I, although I have um, experience with them when I worked in the county, it worked uh, with Mercy House for many years, we didn't want to just hear from your staff person, they're a good organization. So I did due diligence for you and I followed up with three different cities that they are contracting with where they have similar terms and conditions. I had great conversations and email exchanges with the cities of Bakersfield, Bellflower, and Oxenard, who all love Mercy House and had great things to say. So that is one of the requests. And, and, and also, too, you should know that you know when they submit their payments, their subsequent payments when they start uh, billing us, they have to give us backup documentation. So they'll get the, if you approve this, the operational advance. And then when they start billing us regularly, they have to give us detailed backup documentation for the actual expenses. So of course, uh, I'll be reviewing those and then uh, we're able to true up if we need any adjustments on the, the uh, payment that is listed, the monthly payments that are listed in the contract so that we make sure everything is trued up to what the contract allocation is by the end of the year. Also, uh, we have uh, Mercy House is uh, requesting a 10% contingency, mostly for the shelter. And this is really just because they're very experienced in developing new shelters and systems, and sometimes things come up when you're developing a new shelter in a new community. It is not an automatic part of their contract. It's similar to what you've seen on like our construction contracts. So as things, if they come up that were not anticipated, they have to get approval to be able to use the 10% um, contingency. Also, because this is a complete system of services with a lot of moving parts, we do, uh, we, I, uh, we're requesting uh, 638,000 Measure X appropriation to be able to fully fund this. You will see in the, the contract uh, the, the, the whole system of services is leveraged with 66% of federal home and state PLHA funds. But I, but, but I, and so that's a great percentage for your council when you think about your general fund investment and Measure X. They're kind of like one and the same, right? General fund Measure X. Um, but it's a little bit higher this year because we have two years worth of PLHA and we have three years worth of home. So uh, going forward in future years, we'll have um, some decisions to make. So I just wanted to mention that to you. Uh, the other thing is when we first uploaded this agenda item, the contract had under the insurance requirements $10 million automotive, automobile liability. And then uh, Mercy House uh, followed up and after they talked to their insurance broker that out of all the other cities that they contract in that that was extremely high and that their, their standard um, the, the coverage requirements are four million per accident and five million aggregate. I think part of that is Karen Roper made a little boo-boo when she was 
uh, giving information, I said six shuttles, not six drivers. So it's actually two shuttles with six drivers because it's a seven day a week program. So one shuttle for seven days is three drivers and another shuttle is three, so six. So that was just a little, so uh, I have to really give credit and thanks to Dean and Jamie who uh, were so wonderful to talk to our insurance company and we did a quick turnaround, made that little tweak and re-uploaded it. So that was one uh, minor little change. In the meantime, Mercy House has already been partnering with us and they don't even have an approved contract yet, which is really super cool. So we've been meeting with Central Medico Community Clinic because when you're looking at collaborating for certain types of initiatives and grants, you need certain types of supportive services partners. So uh, the county recently had a continuum of care unsheltered notice of funding opportunity. It's special money that is not necessarily guaranteed, but the counties are competing nationwide. I think our county stands maybe a 30% chance of getting these funds. But Mercy House was super collaborative and uh, partnered with Central Medico Community Clinic and myself and looking at, they wanted to, because typically when uh, proposals are submitted to the county, they want to see it surface to a subregion. So uh, the, the PSH proposal was for 34 units of scattered site permanent supportive housing in the cities of both Corona and Norco. And then also they just submitted an application on December the 1st for project-based vouchers for the 12 units. What are project-based vouchers for? When you have permanent supportive housing, you have people that are basically living on disability income. The rents are so extremely low that the projects, it's very difficult for them to cash flow. So uh, they, they already, uh, they uh, did a great job on the proposal and it's already been submitted. And so, and that's referenced in the contract also. That, and we don't, they're not even, officially on, on contract with us, but that's just the type of partner that Mercy House is. So let's talk about the other component of the security agreement. So basically what had been happening is we were experiencing uh, multiple break-ins that were having an impact on our police department. And in, in, on the weekends, we had saw on our, because the security system is in, people climbing over the fence, they broke the fence, stole the contractors, all of his equipment and everything out of his um, trailer, break-ins inside of the building, vandalism. So we, we realized because the building is vacant, we needed security. Uh, thanks to um, Dr. Turner and her staff, they had an existing contract already for security services. So after discussions with um, Jacob, we needed to get security on site. So we've had them there since August, and we're gonna need them to stay until the end of January, because when Mercy, ha if, if you approve their contract, they take the time to get three bids from their vendors. So it's gonna take them time. So probably February, they will have a security vendor that will be on site. So that's $96,000 that we need to reimburse the contract PO that um, is in Ann's shop to help us address this issue. So also a path of life. So when we think about, we've had these multiple conversations where I've said to you, our estimated date is, and it seems like things have happened, right? And it's not bad, it's all good things. Oh, we decided to change the shelter to add a clinic and then we had to do all these ADA improvements and oh my goodness, now we have supply chain issues. So trying to be safe because we know we need to have shelter beds for people that are in crisis and our city must comply with Martin versus Boise, so our police department must be able to enforce anti-camping laws that offer real shelter beds. I am recommending to extend the Path of Life contract through the end of June. They are requesting a cost increase from $60 per bed to $80 per bed. That's actually a deal. It's not that expensive, and in fact, um, our, I think our fully loaded motel cost ranges anywhere from 90 to 100 hundred dollars so you know that's not too excessive for a shelter bed so basically it's going to increase the overall contract that's already existing to 249,000 but uh, excuse me yes it's hundred and twenty thousand dollars bringing it to 249,000 to take it through the end of June and that concludes oh 
I have to, before I finish, I just have to say, I, I think you all know that there are numerous city departments involved in this effort that support homeless solutions from our community services department to planning and development to our police department to finance to purchasing uh, people in management services, but most of all to our city manager. And I don't say this because he's my boss and I'm trying to you know, impress him. I'm telling you as elected officials, coming from someone that's been in government for many years, I've seen many a city manager and I've seen many a CEO and in those positions, they can make or break the success of local government. And we really are fortunate to have Jacob Ellis. So if you're happy about the progress tonight, I hope you'll give it to him. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Roper. Um, Ms. Edwards, I'm, I'm gathering that there are maybe a few speaker cards. Mayor, we have 19 cards for That's this That's what item. I thought. Well, come on down. Welcome. Hello, how are you guys? Great. Great. This is exciting, this is exciting. So, you know, I'm thinking back to when I first met Karen, um, gosh, um, 2019, we had just overcome homelessness ourselves. We had just been housed. Um, we started attending the homeless solutions meetings. And back then, there wasn't a lot going on, right? Here we are four years later. <laughs> you guys, I'm blown away. Um, so much has been happening. So many wonderful partnerships and just so many people working together to house our community. Um, I feel like just in the last six months alone, you know, there have been so many families housed. It just was like the floodgates opened and all of a sudden the housing was there. The families with the vouchers, everyone just got housed. And it's because of this great program, this great homeless strategic plan that Karen has come up with, you know, sitting at, you know, we've doubled sitting at reps. We've got double hope team officers. Angels over cliffs is growing. And, um, I'm just happy. Karen, where's Karen? You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. This is really amazing. Um, I'm excited for the future. Um, I didn't come with anything to say, you know, I'm <laughs> just you. happy. I'm just That's happy, good. you know, um, coming out of homelessness and addiction, um, living in that motel for two years, there was never anyone who came to check on us. And it was the loneliest time of my life. And now we have so many programs, boots on the ground, you know, doing the outreach, hitting the streets, hitting the parks, hitting the motels. And it's just an amazing feeling. It's an amazing feeling. I'm so happy to be a part of this community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Come on down. Good evening, Mayor. And council, my name is Tanya Torno. I'm one of the deputy directors with our county's Housing and Workforce Solutions Department. And I directly oversee our homeless continuum of care services. And so through that role, I have the privilege of working very closely with Karen, who um, in addition to representing your city, also serves as our continuum of care chair. And I just, you know, I've been in these meetings before and I've commended you for the work that you've done in really building out a homeless system of services, as Karen described it, that really ensures that someone who is experiencing homelessness not only receives temporary interim housing, but is connected to permanent housing and wraparound care that they need to, you know, lead purposeful lives like like we do, you know, and that um, allows us to wake up every single morning and um, find meaning in, in what we do. In my role as the director of our continuum of care, I have the privilege of overseeing different federal and state grants that we receive. And so in that process, I can tell you that I've 
uh, participated and reviewed uh, various proposals uh, like the one that Mercy House submitted and I wanted to share that um, I also participated in the RFP evaluation uh, committee for uh, your the, the homeless system of services. And um, you can see from my scores that I was also very impressed with the proposal that, that Mercy House submitted. And like Karen shared, they're in 67 cities, which I think alone speaks to the great work that they're doing. And I can tell you that um, there is um, there are other cities in our county that also work with them and have experienced um, some of the same results that have already been shared. Additionally, I wanted to um, add that um, what I spoke with one of my colleagues, Marcus Cannon, who is a di director with the Riverside University Health System, Behavioral Health, and although he was not able to be here today, he also wanted to stress that on behalf of his department, they are very grateful for the work that the city of Corona is doing because, again, it ensures that individuals receive housing and supportive services in order to you know, truly receive the, the support that they need to resolve their homelessness. So thank you again for what you are doing. You are truly a model city, a city that uh, we share and commend not only here, but also when we go out and try to engage other cities to uh, partner with us to address homelessness in their communities. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you, Karen Spiegel, Riverside County Supervisor. Well, those of you who don't know, Corona has been actively um, addressing homelessness for over three decades. Now it's been a, sometimes it's been a different level, more aggressive or less, uh, different partners. As the population has grown, obviously the population of homeless has grown, as well as some of the adversities that we've been having with the economy swings, uh, some of the laws from Sacramento. With all this, you guys have really hit rock. Let me tell you, I, it's exciting to watch this. I was a part of it here in Corona in the early days. Um, Karen's leadership over these past few years working with her, her excitement, her enthusiasm, her just everything about her, her drive has really moved Corona. And what you are, have before you tonight is the most well-rounded program. You know, we always talk about homelessness and you can give somebody housing, but if you don't give services, they're not gonna succeed. If you give them services and don't give them housing, they're not gonna succeed. You have got the whole services for homeless together. Um, the comprehensiveness of it and the variety that will address all different from families to individuals. This will transform the lives of Corona's homeless and improve the quality of life for residences and businesses and I've met with Mercy Housing about three years ago. And I am excited that they're gonna be stepping up, speaking into existence, um, and that they will be a part because I see great things and you guys really have worked hard and I think this community needs to know how well that you have handled this and I'm excited for the outcomes of this. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council, staff. Uh, my name is Greg Rodriguez. I'm also a Deputy Director with the Housing and Workforce Solutions for Riverside County. Um, I've been on the job for four months now. Um, my role is uh, through government relations and community engagement. Uh, prior to this job, I actually worked for Supervisor Perez and ran the collaborative efforts uh, regionally out in the Coachella Valley amongst all nine cities, the counties, and tribes around homelessness and housing efforts. Um, I have followed this project for more than a year or two. Um, I have the pleasure of having Karen is my vice chair on the continuum of care. I had to step down with my new role and can't imagine anybody better uh, to take over that role. I'll echo everything everybody else has said. You have one of the most dynamic people in Karen. I would never let her go because um, you would lose a whole lot for her. Um, again, I have followed this project. I'm actually doing a similar project out in the Palm Springs area. It's about a $30 million project, but again, to Supervisor Spiegel's point, 
you're really looking at a holistic approach. And I can't, again, applaud Karen enough for that. But again, utilizing the best practices approach that we know work, the housing first model, but again, targeting the different populations, whether that's our taste and our youth, whether it's our families, seniors, et cetera. Again, um, uh, through the home, homeless services plan, uh, through the subcontractors that you have, Mercy House, I will also attest to as one of the best providers that we have in the state. We're hoping they have a bigger footprint uh, in, in the county as we move forward. I would just end on um, that your continuing investment as a county, and I, I too want to applaud you as a council. Um, again, I've monitored your actions. Um, you're going to make my job with Corona very easy because I don't think I have to engage you as much um, as a governmental body. That doesn't mean I'm not going to be back. Um, but again, your leadership, your political will um, we have not seen in the western part of the county, especially southwest uh, part of the county, so I applaud that. But again, I applaud your ability to actually take the recommendations from Karen and, and be able to communicate to the public and to your constituents uh, the benefits not only to that this will have to Corona um, and Corona's homeless residents, but more importantly to residents as a whole. But with these continued investments, I think you already know that you're leveraging tremendous amounts of other dollars. Uh, county programs such as the CBAT teams, the mobile crisis management teams, the vouchers that are being used on this project, the ARPA donations that the counties have given, also the home key funding that the county was one of the lead agencies on with you. These continued investments by cities like yours definitely leverage those county and state dollars. As Tanya said, we are utilizing you as Corona in addition to a couple other cities throughout Riverside to elevate that city-county partnership, because we know that one governmental organization, one nonprofit, uh, you know, one for-profit company is not going to solve this issue by itself. It takes everyone at the table, and you are leading in that um, uh, effort. And we, as a county, I commit to you, will continue that partnership and really uh, encourage your approval of this. So thank you. Thank you. Come on up. I'm seeing Little you're shy. being voluntold. You guys, um, I'm going to speak on behalf of on behalf of Vanessa Rodriguez. Vanessa Rodriguez is a mutual client between CityNet, Angels Over Cliffs, and she is a product of this program. Vanessa was homeless in our city for over two years. Vanessa just got housed a few weeks ago. Thanks to all of these different programs working together. CityNet, Angels Over Cliffs, the City of Corona, Make It Cozy, all of these wonderful organizations. And this is a family who makes me so incredibly proud. She's not only been housed, she is breaking those generational curses. She is breaking the cycles. She is learning, she is growing. And this is a product of our homeless strategic plan, Ms. Vanessa Rodriguez. Um, I wanted to say thank you, especially to Jim, for helping me move in. And his own furniture, he... Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Come on down. I didn't know I was going to cry before he came up here crying. It's okay, everybody's doing it. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, good evening, uh, everybody, mayor and council members. My name is Marissa, and I'm with my own non uh, nonprofit Love Foundation. And I, I'm, it's in hopes to bridge the gap of judgment due to financial, religious, or cultural backgrounds, bringing hope and joy back to the community one soul at a time. Um, I feel like we need to retrain our brain to get back to pure thinking, simple pleasures, warm feelings in our heart, jumping in a puddle of water, the smell of, of the rain, you know, the driveway after the rain, staring at a Christmas tree and being grateful with the hot cocoa in your hand, a simple mental check-in with a friend or family. Um, if I may make a suggestion for the homeless strategic plan, I think a minimum of three-day detox, uh, depending on the folks, um, a decent meal, a haircut, a good shower, and an outfit for success. Offer help and make sure you let them remember they're special and important and worthy of the best life ever. Um, some people can't handle to cohabitate because some of our ladies have been sexually abused. 
So they're not comfortable with the co-ed uh, situation sometimes. Um, we really got to know our people and where to put them and that way they feel safe and comfortable to open up and bring down those layers of onion, you know, those onion layers and get down to the nitty gritty of why are we hurting? Why are we here? And are we going to pass this on to our children if we don't you know, take the wool over our eyes and just be honest and love each other. And you guys are doing an excellent job. Thank you for being there for us. Karen Spiegel, Bobby Spiegel, all, you know, we're already doing the, what was it, the blue zone, right? We're already kind of doing a miniature blue zone ourselves because it takes a village and that's what we are right here, you guys. And we're, we just need to be open, love each other, be courageous. I'm being courageous right now, I'm so scared. But, um, you know, we're doing it. We're doing it. We're seeing the action. We can do better, though. We could. We always can. There's room for improvement, always. Um, I personally have been at Pathway to Life Shelter, feeding the people, telling them to stay alive till we find a, a parking lot structure, because it's already been passed. Um, it's going to be like a triage for them, so the people that are living in their cars can park somewhere safe. Um, we're shopping for that right now, Dr. Laura says. Um, so this strategic plan, I hope, will work. And once again, I offer all my services for free. I'll go in there, hugs, food, whatever you guys need, I'll help. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. I'm back. My name is Cheryl Lum, and I live in Corona. I'm here to represent Corona United Methodist Church. And Karen Roper came and told us about the strategic plan. And we got very excited about it. And so we wanted to uh, thank you, the council, for approving the strategic plan because we think that this is going to be a major, major event in our community. Our outreach committee there at Corona United Methodist Church was looking for ways to help the community. And we would like to have some hands-on ways so we were looking and, and we were thinking about helping our neighbors that need services that include housing and food and health care and skills to learn how to live independently, or if not living independently, to have wraparound services and, and care for them as well. This will improve lives of individuals and the community. Uh, before my retirement, I was a drug and alcohol counselor. I was also a mental health counselor. So I know that the homeless often have one or the other or both. There at the church, we want to be able to be in partnership with Corona um, Homeless Solutions. We're looking forward to helping it in uh, Harrison House to do volunteer service in whatever way that could be. So, uh, so why do we serve? What, what's that all about? Well, in Matthew 25, Jesus teaches compassion and mercy. When you do it to one of the least of these, you do it unto me. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor Speak uh, and City Council members. My name is Nikki Cater. I'm on the board of trustees at Corona United Methodist Church, where I'm also one of two lay leaders and a member of our church council. I also sing in God's House Band. I met Karen Roper when she conducted a presentation at our church about Corona's homeless plan. I am here to speak in favor of the agenda item tonight to fund Mercy House as the city's shelter and housing program operator. Support for the homeless transforms lives. I know, I used to be homeless. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was a meth addict for 22 years, and for a large portion of those years, I was homeless, couch surfing, or incarcerated. I fed my addiction by selling my body. I got clean on October 16th, 2015, because I was going to give the baby that I was, up for, that I was pregnant with up for adoption. This would be the second child I gave up. The first was in 2012. After the adoption went through in 2016, I went to visit my daughter, who was 11 years old at the time and living with my sister here in Corona. After spending some time together, I came to realize that I wanted to change my life so I didn't miss out on her life. I was tired of the chaos that I was living in. I went back to Las Vegas to clear up the warrants I had there. Then I turned myself into Riverside County Drug Court offices in Cathedral City, who I'd been on the run from for 10 years. It was unheard of for someone to turn themselves in after such a long time. 
but I was clean and I wanted to live a better life, so I took the steps to do just that. I was taken to see the judge in Indio and was remanded into custody. I was held for two weeks, then I was transferred to Robert Presley Detention Center, where I found out I was getting fed kicked, which is a federally mandated release. I was given a court date a month out and was released with a bunch of ladies that were exactly like the person I was trying not to be anymore. None of them thought I could change, and they weren't shy about telling me that. That was very empowering. I was going to prove to everyone, including myself, that I could change my life. I called my sister and told her I was being re released and asked if I could head to her house. She said yes. Two weeks later, I had an interview to work at the Shell gas station on Rimpon Magnolia, and I actually got the job. Two weeks after that, I was able to go to court in Indio, gainfully employed, and ask if my case could be transferred to Riverside. They said, not yet. I was given another court date another month out, and when I showed up for that, they transferred my case. I believe this was a test. The courts were giving me chances to mess up. They wanted to see if I was serious. I was very serious. At my next court date in Riverside, I found out that I no longer qualified for drug court as I was no longer abusing drugs. It was bittersweet. I didn't have to meet all of the drug court requirements, but still needed to learn how to live my life without the drugs that I had always depended on. I was sentenced to 100 hours of community service and provisional probation. It took me a year to finish my community service at the Corona Norco Settlement House, which is where I met members of my church, Sally Carlson, who led the choir, and Alan Davidson, who was the drummer for God's House Band, and had invited me to go to church. Soon after that, I finished paying off my fines. Reentry society was difficult, thank you. <laughs> I could not have done it with, on my own, but with the love and support of my family and my church family, I was able to change the life that I thought I'd be doomed to live forever. I'm no longer the hopeless dope fiend that you pass by on your way to work. I'm now a dopeless hope fiend that wants to shine a light for those still suffering. Thank you. Thank you. And that's who we're championed for, right? Is folks like that, because we need to invest in them. Uh, my name is Chriselda Terporton. I'm a longtime resident in the city of Corona here in the circle. And I'm here to definitely advocate that we continue being courageous and moving forward with efforts like this to invest in folks like that, right? In 2017, um, I joined a local community-based organization called Building a Beloved Corona. We wanted to produce a qualitative research on our community to find out what's happening. Are people um, uh, happy with what's happening here? Can we have improvement? Essentially, we wanted to be a bridge and be that voice and bring it to our local leaders. When we actually met with our city manager then um, and our elected leaders, there was no support. The support was, here's a box of uh, click it and what, whatever the, our, our thing is called, um, to spread the word about you know graffiti dumping, et cetera, which was not our audience. It was like really house, helping the unhoused folks. In 2018, I actually spearheaded Corona's very first resource fair because if the city was not going to champion my efforts and our need in the community, we were going to do it on our own. We had 40 vendors there. We had um, lots of folks that came through. And what we learned through that qualitative report is essentially that, again, what Karen mentioned and Angela mentioned is people want to support. There was just not a vehicle to help. So that's where we stepped in, right? Um, so then come 2019, we were getting some elected uh, leaders, such as um, Jim Steiner um, and um, Yolanda Correa as well. I spearheaded the second resource fair. And that's when, of course, we did it at the city park, because you meet folks where they're at. We met Angela and all these other wonderful folks. We had 80 vendors. Again, people want to support. We just had to create a space. We had to get champions in our elected um, space to give us those resources. But if you're not going to do it, we're going to step up and do it for you all, right? So now here we are in 2022. Like, I cannot wrap my head that we came so far. But essentially, and to be honest and be real, we just had to get new leaders. 
Leaders who were compassionate, leaders who cared and wanted to invest in folks like the lady before me, right? And as the woman mentioned uh, before her is we have compassion now, right? Corona's trying to figure out who our identity is. And I think you're really spearheading that compassion and it's contagious, so continue that. And now hopefully we'll have mercy. So as the speaker before said, compassion and mercy. So please move forward, be courageous, keep championing this, invest in our, our, our fellow uh, human beings, right? Because we cannot waste any resources to not invest in them. We need life, we need you guys to give us hope and continue that work. So thank you all. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Matt Bates. I'm the executive vice president for CityNet. Um, I live in Azusa, California. Uh, as a brief aside, I drove here in my car, which also has a clutch pedal. And <laughs> <laughs> Bravo, one, sir. Bravo. One other aside, uh, I, I applaud your movement into the blue zones. Um, I try to remind my wife that French fries are also vegetables. Um, <laughs> Although I don't know if that'll count, but um, I'm here to, uh, to speak on, uh, um, in support of item number 30. Um, CityNet, we're a proud partner uh, in the city of Corona um, as we conduct street outreach and engagement with homeless neighbors. Um, we have four full-time case managers that do that. We also operate the, or manage the 25-room motel uh, emergency shelter program in the city. Um, we're encouraged to see the, the progress in the city. When we started working in Corona in, in 2018, the city only had five shelter beds through Path of Life, um, and CityNet was only uh, contracted to, to deploy uh, two, two part-time outreach and engagement staff that were working three days a week. And part of the, the challenge back then was uh, you'd come across homeless neighbors who were wanting to change, who were wanting to get off the streets, and there were just limited resources and limited beds. So we were very uh, excited um, on this item tonight, but more broadly, um, for the city's uh, uh, growth in its homeless strategic plan. Uh, we've been proud to work with Karen Roper and others in the city to participate in the development of that plan. Um, and it's very exciting to see that come to fruition in another part tonight. Um, CityNet, like uh, Mercy House, works across the state of California. We work in seven counties. Uh, um, not quite uh, as many cities. We're, we're in just over 50 cities. Um, but I would echo the statements that have been made tonight, which is that what you're doing here in the city is really a model that we wish others across the state would replicate. Um, we really do wish that we could bring people here and show them the, the, the overall approach. And I think the, the key difference is the, the approach to homelessness, not as a series of programs that are discrete, but to think of it as a systemic uh, issue that, that needs a systemic response. Um, this, this, and this contract that you're considering tonight is not just a shelter, but it's a system of, of related uh, resources. And CityNet is happy to participate in those. Um, along with your CPD HOPE team, we are listed in the, as a referring agency in the Mercy House contract. We're very comfortable in this role as we have a great working relationship with Mercy House. Um, and we already work in this capacity with them in other cities, including Bellflower. Um, we're also been hard at work uh, in preparing clients for the abode communities uh, that will start in the spring. And when this shelter opens in the spring, um, we're encouraged to be part of that kind of network of related activities that will not only help individual people, but that will help the city get closer to its goal of ending homelessness and corona. So I applaud the work that you've done, encourage you to support item 30, and thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Hi. My name is Virginia Caridi. I'm from St. Edward's Food Pantry. Where did this time go? <laughs> I mean, like, seriously, eight years is a long time. <laughs> but thank you, Jim and Wes, for coming out to City Park to meet our homeless where they were, where the rest of us found them. Tom, for your support. Jackie, of course. And Tony. Thank you. And our unsung hero, our city manager. Thank you. I know he doesn't like that, but anyway. Thank you for making this possible. Um, I wanted to tell you something because Jim once said to me, keep telling me these stories, I have to hear them because I only meet the homeless as a fireman and they've got drugs hanging out of their pockets or whatnot, so I'll tell you one last story. The part about this shelter that touches my heart is the recuperative care beds that we're going to have. Um, we used to have a female citizen, her name was Rose, and she was 
discharged with lung cancer and she had nowhere to go. So she was like on our streets of Corona at one point living on the floor of a trailer. But um, I think that it was Rose who inspired those recuperative care beds and I wish that she had lived to know that. She died this past summer. See, I'm gonna cry again, I don't wanna do that. Um, but that really touched my heart, those five recuperative care beds for Rose Stout. Um, Working with K-1 was a joy. Sometimes, you know, people have difference of opinions and we had one this past summer and, and I thought that the, there was too many people hanging out the door. There was 50, 60, 70, 80 people hanging out the door on the waiting list and we had this meeting and then nothing came of it and then two days later something came of it. So I thought that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, so it was a joy to work with her and all the groups that got together, all the organizations, we make each other stronger. And that was because you opened up the table to us. You let us come to the table and give you our ideas and our concerns, just like we're doing right now. And so I would like to end with one last thing. Um, I called the police earlier today because there was a homeless woman on South Main Street and East Grand at the Valvo Line station, and she's sleeping on the sidewalk about that far from the curb at that intersection. And I'm sure that they responded to the call. However, on my way here, she was still there, or she returned. She's just sleeping on the corner with her head up against the street light. Her head's that far from the street. So I, I don't know what kind of help she needs, but she needs help. Thank you so much. I love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Mark Allard, 637 Greengate. Uh, Wednesday night is church night. You can usually find me at Stone Church uh, with, my, <laughs> with my blessed pint engaged in fellowship. This is true. I've, I've seen um, Mark many times. You, however, have, have pulled me from my station to uh, come here and express uh, sincere uh, thankfulness for your service, but uh, your leadership. Uh, I would specifically name Jim and Yolanda, uh, you know, some years ago, you guys uh, took your curiosity and you went vulnerable with this community and said, there's just a lot we don't know and we need to learn. And you were uh, honest about that and from that place, uh, you know, leadership really flowed. And uh, a lot of these pieces have come together, uh, you know, Karen and Karen and advocates and, and agencies, you know, collaboration, CityNet, Brad, a lot of these voices came together in ways that um, I just really wish Sally was here tonight yeah. to see this. And uh, you know, in her, in her spirit, just thank you. Thank you. Enthusiastic thanks. Thank Back you. to my pint. <clears throat> Welcome, sir. Good evening. One of the main things you need to remember is that Karen Roper is an absolute treasure. And this would not have happened without her. I um, have led a very, very fortunate life. I can't say that very much bad has happened to me, so I don't have one of those fittingly s sorry stories. Uh, my closest uh, approach to homelessness is when I would worry if my wife was going to let me back in the house. And uh, fortunately, I always made it. But um, I remember the times that Virginia Caridi would be bringing in boxes of pizza, the city park, trying to feed people, Virginia and some other people. And uh, I was recently in the Corona Citizens Academy, and the last w evening of that was spent with Karen, who were explaining all the things the city had been doing to try to take care of homelessness. I was amazed. I couldn't. If there was a test on it, I'd flunk. I couldn't remember all that stuff. But I came away impressed that she's a genuine, absolute treasure. I don't know how you find people like that and you want to hang on to them. And if you lose them, I don't know how you replace them. I don't know how that happens. So I, you know, my life has been really fortunate. I don't touch much of that. I'm, you know, just an old worn out throttle jock. But uh, I think you need to re be feeling really, really good about all of this. And you feel really, really good this city is moving forward. I have a very good friend who works in another city in manufacturing. And I'm not going to tell you what the city is. 
but he comes to the house and he tells me just some absolute horror stories of the mess of what homelessness is in that area. And we're making progress here, and this is terrific, and I think everybody ought to feel really good about this. And if you see Karen Roper sometime, buy her a dinner or something, because <laughs> something, because she's a treasure for this town. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Guy, it's hard not to be emotional tonight. Um, I am Donette Wheat. I have lived in Corona almost 30 years, and um, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and have been on many interfaith councils working to figure out how to care for the poor and the needy in our community. There is an incredible group of people in this room and out in the community that you're right, we are a team. Corona is a gem. I've known it since the day I stepped foot. And I just want to thank the city council, each one of you, and our city manager for your leadership, your real, your genuine. And that's what Corona needs. We love, we are all God's children. And I was raised by parents that taught me that we are all God's children and we need to take care of each other. And that's what we're doing. So I fully support this move that we're making. It feels like a lot of money. But you know what? It brings joy to my heart to be able to go to the gas station and not see all of the homeless and to know that we have a plan. And I just want to thank Karen all the Karens, but Karen Roper. <laughs> what a miracle. When I met her, I knew, oh my gosh, we're supposed to be friends. We're like-minded. So thank you all for all of your work. And I just want you to know moving forward that as I'm an administrator for JustServe.org, that I, we look for opportunities and projects to serve and bring community together to provide whatever is needed for anybody that needs help and volunteers. All right, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Paul Binder Badesha um, with, and obviously Bobby Spiegel, who's famous, uh, with the Corona <laughs> Chamber. Um, just want to applaud you as a city council and your leadership for the adoption, hopefully adoption of this homeless system of services. Um, I worked in the homelessness and housing field in England for a long time, and we always knew that um, the only projects that really worked out were those that had support elements involved um, because solving homelessness isn't just about placing that roof. And uh, as you know, um, issues related to homelessness are the number one complaint that we hear about at the chamber and some horrific stories. And we have seen so much love and compassion here this evening and those business owners and employees also feel that and they've been torn for many years about what to do about this. So we welcome the continued collaboration and communication with you all. The, the other uh, number two and number three are like permits and things like that. We'll talk about those another time. Um, <laughs> just want to also give a huge shout out to this amazing soul, Karen Roper. She has ha got that amazing ability to work within government and the public sector, but cross and drop or knock down all the walls and fences. So thank you so much for what you have done, Karen, to bring many, many different interests together. She is a total gem and we are so proud of her. Thank you. Thank Bobby. you. Doesn't she do great? Absolutely. <laughs> so again, uh, I applaud you. I think, Jim, you were the one that actually located Karen to begin with, if I'm correct on that. And then you brought her and, of course, Jacob and the others. Every, everything got together, and you guys should applaud yourself. You should be doing backflips and high fives because um, 
we see down the road there is such a future for the homeless, those individuals, and as my wife has always taught me, is you've got some that are sick, some that want to choose to be homeless, and um, others that are just a paycheck away from being homeless. So what you guys are doing right now has just been tremendous. Our business community thanks you. We are here to work with you. Um, I know that I extended a phone call over to the vice mayor when you were gone on your honeymoon, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> but uh, he ended up, uh, was able to talk to a uh, business owner. We have challenges constantly and um, uh, it's, it's reassuring to see that there is a future here and that there's gonna be some great things. But I would be remiss if I didn't say that the meme of Karen's is totally wrong when it deals in Corona with all the Karen's. <laughs> So, Karen Roper, I love you, I respect you, and you're awesome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, honorable council members, my name is Andy Piscolian. I'm the CEO of Central Medical Community Clinic. First, let me thank you for allocating the three million in funding for phase one and phase two improvements at the Harrison Shelter Navigation Center. I would especially like to thank you for your support to convert the west wing of the shelter to house our Central Medical Community Clinic satellite. Thank you for that. I've been working with Karen Roper and your construction team on details regarding the improvements related to the clinic, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice, uh, related to the clinic portion of the shelter. It's been a pleasure working with the team and we are thrilled with our experience on the project this far. I'm extremely pleased with the report Central Medical received on the site approval on October 4th from HRSA. HRSA is the governing agency that oversees community clinics. We look forward to partnering with City of Corona, <clears throat> excuse me, Mercy House to provide medical, behavioral, and oral, oral health care services to Corona homeless residents receiving services for emergency shelter residents at the Harrison facility transportation meal program clients receiving day services at the Navigation Center, Corona's motel emergency shelter clients, residents of permanent supportive housing projects in the city of Corona. We also look forward to collaborating with City and Mercy House in the developing partnership with Corona Regional Medical Center for post-hospital rec recuperative care and look forward to providing medical services for Corona's homeless clients discharged from their hospital. Also, we're happy to work with Karen Roper and Mercy House on two recent grant applications for new scattered site permanent supportive housing and project-based vouchers for the Fifth Street housing units. I would like to close by commending the city, City of Corona, for its leadership, support to develop a homeless strategic plan, but more importantly, to exec execute a homeless strategic plan. Our community, our community will not change if we continue to fight reality. To overcome, we must cultivate new models of care, creative solutions to make homelessness obsolete. I believe what we have here is the perfect example of that, and I'm grateful for the city, to our partners in this project, and especially Karen Roper, who has really been a champion for change. Thank you, Karen. The contract before you tonight supports our complete system of services, services that will heal the city's homelessness. I want you to all know that I'm working to replicate Corona's model in other communities where we have other clinics. As I strongly believe in this model and the effect it will not only have on individuals experiencing homelessness, but also communities as a whole. Thank you, city. God bless you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, thank you. Uh, Sam Mutani, I'm the CEO of Corona Regional Medical Center. As we all know, Corona is home to the third largest unsheltered homeless population. So naturally, Corona Regional being the only hospital in the region, we provide hospital services, emergency services to countless homeless patients on a daily basis. The challenge we face is when they're done, being hospitalized, there's no place for them to go. 
and the street is an unhumane place to discharge them. So we hold on to them. And unfortunately, in Riverside County, there's only one shelter located in downtown Riverside <clears throat> that can accept them. And they have very limited beds. And they're always full. And at sometimes when there's a bed, our homeless patients don't want to go to Riverside City. They want to stay here in our blue zone. They don't want to go anywhere else. So this program, and with those five recuperative beds, is going to solve a huge problem, not only for the homeless, but also for the rest of the citizen of Corona. Because when these patients are occupying beds that they don't need anymore because they don't need hospitalization, it creates a backlog to the rest of the patient that do need that care. So it solved two problems. So, and what makes this program even more effective is that it's a comprehensive solution. Not only is going to provide recuperative care, but once they're done, it will provide emergency shelter for them and hopefully permanent housing. So those patients are no longer homeless, which means it's going to provide a taxpayer savings because being in a hospital is the most expensive way of housing these patients and these homeless. So this program will save taxpayer money, will save the police department and the fire department countless trips and visits to dealing with them. So with your approval tonight, hopefully, Corona Regional Medical Center will team up with the city of Corona, with Mercy House, and Central Medical Community Clinic to develop a, mem a memorandum of understanding to develop a care for this shelter. So with your approval, I'm looking forward for a yes vote on this, and thank you for allowing me time to speak tonight. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Good evening, Karen Alexander. Uh, today is not only a history day for uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, a solemn remembrance, but a local history day because we're here, and, and number 30 is before you. Um, Alexander Graham Bell once said that the only difference between success and failure is the ability to take action. And counsel, you decided to take action. When others were hesitating, you went forward. You did the investigation. You jumped right in. You figured out what the assessment is of our city, uh, what it took to combat that, and put resources together. Um, you uh, hired an expert in her field, uh, K1, she developed the plan for your review and your consideration and you adopted it fearlessly when others weren't doing that and stepping up. So uh, building a system is not just a plan, it's a complete system. And just to be a little page turned over in that book of a plan uh, is an honor. I'm gonna blame Donette for bringing the tears here. I was doing fine until she stood up there. So congratulations. Uh, I wanted to also congratulate um, uh, Jacob Ellis for putting a team together to support Ms. Roper in her uh, undying efforts and dedication and energizer system. I don't know where she gets it. I really don't. Um, but you're a shining beacon in the county, showcasing for others what model to move forward. And on a serious note, um, the RFP to score 93% for Mercy House, how lucky are we that they have the capacity to meet 358 pages that Ms. Roper put together as the operation plan, <laughs> and she will hold their feet to the fire. So thank you, Council. Thank you. Welcome. Hi there. Um, my name's Kim Lay, and I've been a Corona resident for since 2009, and I just wanted to um, basically echo everything that's been said at the meeting tonight. Um, I first off wanted to thank Karen Roper for all the countless hundreds and thousands of hours that she has put into this homeless strategic plan. Um, I remember going to meetings. Um, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I attend a lot of uh, city and meetings and clergy meetings. And I remember attending one where there was a lot of contention in the room, a lot of differences of opinions on how to handle the homeless. And it was a very uncomfortable meeting. And so it's it's wonderful to be here to see all of the support and the um, positivity 
that I see now that we have a solution and we have a plan in place to help with this, this issue that we have in Corona. And I also wanted to thank the city council members and our mayor and everybody um, for, for doing the work and being willing to listen and being willing to move forward in a plan to help our homeless friends. And um, I just wanted to share uh, just a few personal experiences through working with my church. We've, you know, we've got, it's a very comprehensive plan, the home, homeless strategic plan, and, but yeah, it's pretty, a lot of it is already working through the partners that the city has partnered with, with. Um, and with our church, we have, in the youth from our church and members, we have partnered with uh, CityNet to help make homeless kits for the homeless. Um, we've partnered with Make It Cozy to help them with the furniture and move them, move the furniture from houses to the warehouse to the new, to the homes where the home, uh, where our friends, our homeless friends are, are being rehoused to. And um, Angels Over Cliffs, we've been able to partner with them as well and our youth. So we're, um, it's very a very exciting thing to see. And um, I just wanted to say that, you know, because it is a very comprehensive plan, you know, there's a lot of pieces, but we look forward to working with the city and with these um, partners as um, personally and through our church uh, to be able to help the this plan um, succeed and to help you achieve your, your goals. So thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. I wasn't trying to be last. I was trying to make sure everybody's name got recorded. Um, look, this is an example of why I'm excited about local government. I'm excited about local politics. The, the possibilities are not endless, but they're substantial. And, and it's an, this is an antidote for the cynicism that people have about government. I mean, the, to watch Ms. Roper work and the way she's worked, you know, the way that uh, Virginia and Mark and Paul Bender talked about, she, she builds bridges between people and, and here's what they, what do you have to contribute? You want to help? Here you go. Here, here's, a, here's a phone number. Here's a way to do it. And it can be small things. It can be big things. But she's going to, you know, she's going to bring you into the system. She'll open the door. And this is an evident, this is an example of what happens when you open the doors. When you open the doors and you bring people in, um, look, this is a policy. This is a, there, there are exciting opportunities here because I'm telling you this issue is at the top of everybody's list, whether they love homeless people or whether they hate homeless people. You can bring everybody together to the same table. I've watched Karen make people who are really, really upset about what's going on go, oh, I think we got something here. Like she, I've seen her make a believer out of a non-believer, and that's substantial. I mean, things have moved here, um, and they moved here largely because of this guy with the with the white hair over here, grayish white hair. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one of you up there, and you did this. You know, you you uh, Yolanda uh, J and Jason. You know, when he named the committee right off the bat. You know, you knew something changed right there. Yeah, I, he was, he probably fell over when I went and hugged him at that pancake breakfast and thanked him for doing it. You know, it, it, this is, that was a sea change. That was a big moment that something shifted here and we said, we're going to do something here. And you, you brought, you brought Miss Roper here and then she's been the Energizer Bunny, you know, it, she, I, I can't, I'm, I don't want to just keep on going on about that, but um, it's been a team of, many different people from many different walks of life, many different interests. Um, and so I want to applaud everything that's going on here. I know this is going to work because we're doing it the right way and we're, we're bringing everybody in on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Edwards, any, any other speaker cards? Mayor, I do not have any more speaker cards. Okay. So I'm going to go to um, comments from my colleagues. However, I, I, I'd like to go to, to Councilmember Steiner first. Um, Thank you, Mayor. You're very welcome. I'm the guy with the white hair. Huh? That's what I hear. Well, I, listen, you're just bragging because you got hair. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, listen, bragging. you guys, um, I want to first thank all the speakers who came out tonight. Um, 
And for many of the very heartfelt and personal stories that you told, uh, that, that must have been hard for a few of you. Uh, so thank you. Tonight is a historic moment for the city of Corona. Kind of walk you down memory lane a little bit. Uh, when I made the decision to run for council five years ago, I, I pledged to the citizens that I was going to try. I was going to try to do my best and make it a priority to work on real solutions to address homelessness in Corona. Since that time, I've personally been on just a journey of learning. That includes meetings with our homeless advocates, uh, attending seminars, speaking with experts, and touring homeless shelters and transitional housing units and personal supportive housing units from Coachella Valley to Orange County. Former council member Yolanda Carrillo, a couple people mentioned it. We were partners on the Homeless Solutions Ad Hoc Committee. And we did everything together for, for two years, and we soon realized that we just didn't have the expertise or the time that was necessary to develop real solutions to our, our homeless problem. We also didn't have anybody on city staff that had the expertise to lead that effort. We needed a full-time expert, and along came my dear friend, Karen Roper. Karen had served as the homeless and housing czar in Orange County for 35 years, and she had just recently retired. So one day, I think I, was, I think I was in tears, and I was chatting with her, and I told her, you know, we're really struggling to get something off the ground here in Corona. And she says, well, I can help you. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so, yeah. So, of course, we took her up on her offer. Uh, she actually helped in a volunteer capacity for about six months. Um, and then we were able to, to rope her into a f rope, get it? A rope her in? <laughs> Uh, to a full-time a full-time gig and really that's when everything changed there everybody's mentioned this tonight you're 100 percent right Karen made this happen in 2020 we spent six months engaging the community to develop a homeless strategic plan and in June of that year we adopted the plan from June of 2020 to now uh, we have been implementing our homeless plan and building pieces of our system of services that do include the 25 room motel emergency shelter program, expansion of city net from two to four outreach manager or outreach and case managers, expansion of our, of our HOPE team from two to four, uh, uh, the addition of a HOPE uh, Police Department HOPE team sergeant. We invested $3 million in capital funding to renovate our Harrison emergency shelter. So the, the Mercy House contract really fulfills many goals and objectives in our homeless plan because it will literally bring a complete system, including an emergency shelter, two types of housing programs, homeless prevention, recuperative care, uh, plus we're, we're piling in a program to move meal serving out of the parks. So I support staff's recommendation to extend the Path of Life contract to ensure that we have shelter beds while Mercy House works to hire staff and furnish the shelter and the housing units. It's really important to have a smooth transition. Uh, I support the allocation of additional Measure X funds. Uh, the system is critical to the, to the success of our homeless plan. It's uh, important to reiterate that our general funds, Measure X funds, are being leveraged with federal home and state PLHA funds. Uh, because we have made investments to develop and sustain a system, the county has been bringing other resources to support Corona. It includes the Ayers Hotel conversion for 53 units of permanent supportive housing, mobile crisis management team, a million dollar homeless encampment response grant, I could go on and on. Mercy House and uh, Larry Haynes, the CEO, I saw him back there, um, it's a triple A plus organization, and I have personally toured their facilities. There absolutely is a reason that they work in over 67 cities. They have the experience to operate a system of service like ours. Uh, lots of people to thank, but I, I'm going to thank the homeless advocates, really, because that's, that's who I met with early on, and that's who educated me and helped me understand a lot more than, than what I knew at the time. Um, I also want to thank um, past members Yolanda Carrillo and Jason Scott. Um, yeah. Um, you know, and my council colleagues, just for having the, the political courage to do what needs to be done. Of course, I want to thank Karen Roper for working so hard and just bringing it all together. She did it. 
And I, I too think it's um, very, very important to acknowledge our city manager, Jacob Ellis. You know, Jacob, Jacob provided the leadership and the strategic support that Karen Roper needed from multiple city departments just to make this system of services, you know, this effort a reality. And I support the recommended actions and look forward to having the honor of moving this item forward when it comes up. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. <clears throat> Councilmember Casillas. So well said, Jim. You're, you're incredible. Wisdom with gray hair. There it is. Wisdom comes with gray hair. Okay, got it. Skip um, right over to no hair. So. <laughs> or no hair. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, I've, I've been taking notes, jotting notes, changing my notes, um, and I, uh, I just, I, I want to take a point of privilege and, and echo what so many of you have said tonight, that um, there's a lot of kudos to be given. And, you know, as a... a, a a former student of public policy, there's, it's interesting because when you're studying public policy, there's a, a concept that's, uh, that's, that's uh, talked about frequently, which is like a, an opportunity will, window, a policy window to get something done. And you need things to line up. You, know? you, need, you need the actual policy, like to do something right, to know how to do it. Uh, it needs to be the right time. You need to have t a community that's engaged. You need to have, you know, um, will to get this done. And then you need people, people who know how to do it and people in decision-making, you know, positions to actually say yes. And so it doesn't happen often. Um, and when it does happen, you get this kind of you know, cataclysmic, like, amazing um, you know, meeting of all these things, and, and, and you see it here. This is a case study in that, uh, what it takes to get good policy done. And uh, Mark Allert said it earlier, it, it was really, it was Jim and Yolanda's curiosity to ask more and to follow along and to be vulnerable enough to ask the questions and be in uncomfortable spaces and be in uncomfortable meetings and, and be able to say, hey, we don't know the answers, but we want to know the answers. And we want to um, you know, move the city forward because we're, we're going to take accountability and we're going to step up for our community. And so massive, massive kudos to, to Yolanda and to you, Jim, because um, you know, it, takes a, it takes that, um, that spark to get us started and then, and then once you did, you know, relationships went and show, and it shows the impact of relationships. It was that conversation. It was getting your relationships, leveraging your relationships to see how much we can move forward. And Karen, I'm telling you, there's a magic to you. And I just, <laughs> I sent you a love note this last week when I was up in Sacramento or in Monterey for the League of Cities conference because you have a great way of not just bringing people along with you, but teaching people how to speak about this. And I felt so empowered um, speaking to addressing homelessness issues on a state level because of how you have educated and primed me to speak on it in our local level. And so, um, you know, we know that, okay, we can address this and we are addressing it on the local level, but we really need Sacramento to kick it up a notch. And I'm so, so proud of the fact that, and I'll be providing my report later, but one of the top um, issues uh, for this next year's uh, League of Cities policy advocacy um, plan is homelessness and homelessness alone. And that's because of you, Karen, because I was able to speak on it and, and, and debate on it um, using, you know, persuasive arguments um, and examples from your work here locally. So thank you for that. Massive, massive kudos to the community and all of the community advocates. And I hope you know and I hope you're taking, you know, your piece of, um, of, uh, of celebration tonight because this really is a community effort. And I want to... I want to, to say, I'm, just, I'm so proud to be a part of this community. I'm so proud of being a part of this council um, for having the political will, the compassion, and the determination to address this. But I have a really, really big ask for everyone tonight. And that's that this system is going to be big. It's, it is big. It's taking all of us to get here. But it's not going to work like a magic wand. And it will take time. 
and we will undoubtedly still face a bumpy road ahead. And we will face, likely, tough conversations in the future where we will be asked about the cost of this system and the success of this system. So my big ask for everyone in this room, for everyone on this council, is that when the going gets tough, we don't give up. So, so having, um, having that expectation, that will, that compassion to move forward, to recognize that this isn't, tonight isn't when we solve homelessness, right? Tonight is when we build a, um, and invest in this system to address you know, these um, big issues for our unhoused community. So that's my big ask. I am so on board with this. Um, and I know that we're up for the task. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Richens. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, there was a candidate's forum a few months back, and uh, Councilmember Steiner promised to cure uh, menopause. <laughs> and I'm uh, beginning to think that dude can do it. <laughs> so. I'll have to ask Karen Roper for help. <laughs> um, there, there are moments where there's magic in this room, and tonight was one of those moments, and it was a long moment. And it's a moment where hard work is paying off. It's a moment where the road will still be bumpy, but better. And it's a moment where our city can celebrate and move forward. Um, as for K-1, Karen, your city council cherishes you. And, and your city council cherishes all your friends that are here standing behind you tonight, and they've let it be known. I, uh, it's no secret that, that my mother thinks Jim's her favorite city council member. <laughs> and uh, you can see why. And I, too, would like to, to mimic what others have said about our city manager, Jacob Ellis. He, uh, that dude's amazing. Even, even when I'm mad at him, he's still amazing. And uh, he's great, and he's wonderful. And uh, I don't want to drag on with my comments. I do want to say I've never met someone with blue hair that I didn't like. <laughs> and uh, all of you guys are magical, and I thank you. And uh, Jim, I hope you'll be the one that pushes the button for this one tonight. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Vice Mayor? <clears throat> so uh, my default in heavy situations is humor. So here we go. Uh, first, uh, to our city manager, um, Something is in the air here. It keeps getting in all of our eyes. So if we could take a look at that. It's sure. causing my eyes to water. Sure. That's, that's not good. Um, uh, I want to mention that uh, in the beginning parts of uh, Ms. Roper's speech, she highlighted her, um, her gratitude to Dr. Turner and Ms. Gonzalez for um, looking at this plan as a way to help elevate the, all of the other plans. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't remind folks that in Dr. Turner's Previous life, she also, uh, you know, dealt with homeless in other cities, and not only is she the queen of parks here, but she's a pretty well-rounded individual. Um, that that leads me to uh, our city manager, who um, hired her. So, you know, no offense, you're not the smartest guy in the world, but you're smart enough to understand that you got to hire people that are smarter than you. So, congratulations. Um, also, I want to say thank you to uh, Jim and, and uh, Yolanda Carrillo. Or, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yolanda uh, and Jason Scott, there's a great Walt Whitman, Walt Whitman quote that I had to look up. It says, be curious, not judgmental. And if there's any, um, uh, any people out here that um, are a fan of Walt Whitman, I think that quote sums them up pretty good. You have to be curious and not judgmental to really look into something like this. Um, and really, you know, when you, when you look at your own network of people, you know, I, I joked with Jim that um, that he was you know, having a beer with with, with Miss Roper's husband and said, "Hey, you know, she's available. Let's uh, let's get her to help us out." But 
the reality is is that that's a relationship that's almost decades long and and um, how serendipitous is it, it is of him to put those two together at that time. We're really the beneficiaries of that. Um, I, wanna, I wanted to ask the city clerk, uh, I, I, I think this, this must be some sort of record of speakers on one topic and certainly speakers on one topic that weren't yelling at us, so that's great. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, and, and then to Ms. Roper, um, I don't really see what the big deal is here. I mean, we just asked you to create a, a holistic, comprehensive plan to really combat homelessness, include wraparound services, permanent supportive housing, medical clinics, build a clinic, uh, form partnerships, rehab an old shelter, don't piss off Virginia Caridian. If you do, make that right. Um, go out and find a bunch of money that we could spend other people's money in order to support this single-handedly change the outlook of the Karen meme. I mean, really, it seems like just a, an average day's work for most people. So I commend you for, for your approach and for dragging us along. I mean, we weren't going kicking and screaming, but we, we certainly had no idea the, the magnitude that this is going to provide for our community. And you know, my hat's off to you. Really and truly, you're the one that needs to stand up so we can applaud you. This is just, a, which is, yeah, come on. We're gonna be here all night, you gotta stand well up. Well deserved. Come on. One of the most interesting things about Ms. Roper, she definitely is the Energizer Bunny. I've received calls from her at 10 o'clock at night, which is two hours past my bedtime, and I've also received calls from her at 6 o'clock in the morning, and she's already ready to go. She's got 100 miles an hour. Um, you know, there's many highlights, but there was a quote from, from our new friend with the blue hair, and I'm sorry, I, I missed your name, um, but really, no longer a hopeless dope fiend, now a dopeless hope fiend. That, I, I actually wrote that down so I didn't mess that up. That was great. Um, I couldn't support this more. If there's a way that I could vote twice, I would. Um, I'm very excited for 2023 when, when everything comes together. I don't know who's gonna be in charge up here at that time, but um, it's gonna be great. <laughs> so thank you very much. And I also am in support of it when we get to vote. One of these days. One of these days. All right. Um, one of the one of the benefits and the curses of of being the the mayor is is that you get to go last. But I'm I'm very very pleased to to listen to all my colleagues and listen to all of you talk so eloquently about how we got here, and <clears throat> it's been an amazing journey. Really has. Um, you know, and I, I go back and I, I think back to 2018, uh, Karen Alexander called me when I was running for, for council and she said, hey, Jim and I are going to go tour some homeless shelters in, uh, in Orange County. You know, uh, B, you know, you can you know, meet us down here and we're gonna go on a bus. And I said, you're gonna do what? And uh, I didn't know much about it. I, I had you know listened and kind of read and watched a little bit, but didn't know a lot. And, and I want to thank Karen for that invitation and, and uh, got to tour probably about five different homeless shelters from all these different uh, models, different stages. And it really opened my eyes. And I want to say thanks to Jim for, for allowing me to, to accompany, accompany you on that trip. And I learned you know, quite a bit. Um, and that kind of launched my journey to learn more, um, going out in the park and, and meeting folks, and, and I've gotten you know this. Um, my 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 wife tells me all the time, if I see a homeless person, I walk up and I know isn't that funny. I got to say, wife, um, it's almost natural too. It's great um, that I, I constantly will walk up to if I see a homeless person, I I want to walk up and say hi. My name is Wes, and what's your name? And I learned that from Virginia. 
um, and trying to connect them. And it's funny because they know who Karen is. They know the Hope Team officer's names. They know the City Net people's officer's name. And they, they almost repeat to me what I'm going to tell them, um, which is that you know there's a possibility, there's hope, there's all you have to do is say yes. And they go, yeah, 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 I know. I've already talked to, to Angela, and I've already talked to Karen, and I've already talked, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Um, but I, I kind of saw this all work, you know, full circle. I was up, um, uh, Mary and I were having an ice cream up on Main and Foothill, and there was a, a young lady that had, had, was sleeping on the, on the sidewalk. And um, somebody had called the Hope Team. Hope Team came out and talked to her. And, uh, you know, she had to move, and she was in front of a business. And they got her to move. She moved down the street a little bit, uh, saw her the next day, uh, was over getting gas, and uh, she was behind a building. Hope Team officer was there with one of our um, folks from Riverside Community, or I'm sorry, from the county, helping her, and she actually got in the vehicle and accepted help. So it was cool to kind of see it ha actually happen because there was a willingness for, for people to, um, to, to call, to uh, not, not to harass her, not to, not to you know, bug her, but to engage with the people that could actually get her off the street. So I see that as really this kind of like short version of seeing how we've done this because you've all been here. You know, I met most of you um, in different, you know, different parts of my life and, and seeing you all come together. And really, <clears throat> it's because of Karen. She's the connector. And it's really cool to see it all happen tonight. And, and you're right, seeing it, I know, gosh darn it, the dust is up here again. Um, seeing, uh, seeing it all come together tonight and, and being historic is, is really a, a real thing. But I want to say thank you um, to our, our residents, our businesses for being patient. Because I get calls, you all get calls every day complaining about you know um, this or that and, and relate to the homeless and, and we, we funnel them right to Karen. Karen you know takes them from being someone that's angry and upset to being a, an advocate uh, to help um, to understand. Um, taking those people that want to help that don't know how and funneling them to the right people so they can help. Um, <clears throat> So I want to thank I want to thank our, our residents, our businesses for their patience. And as uh, Councilmember Casillas said, it, it's going to be a bumpy road, and we're going to need patience uh, going forward as well. So um, yes, it's a it's a lot of money, um, but uh, yes, it's something that we have to do because it's the right thing, and it's the right thing to help people off the street. So um, so thank you so much, and thank you, Jim, for the. For, for finding, for, for you know, talking um, this poor woman out of retirement and, and uh, making her come and work here for the city. Um, you know, I appreciate that. And thank you for um, Mr. Ellis for making her happy um, and make her happy enough to stay here and, and, and work uh, because frankly, I, I don't think that would work anywhere else. So thank you to you for, for being the catalyst to, to have our connector here. So with that, I will um, offer uh, Councilmember Steiner here the opportunity to uh, make the motion. Do I need to read this? Of course, no. You Everything? No. <laughs> no, are you sure? All of them. All of them. No, nothing right. in blue. I move for approval. All right. Do we fight for the second? <laughs> Go ahead, Jackie. Oh, I'd like to second. Excellent. All right, let's please vote. It's a tough one, Tom. Councilmember Richens, I can do your voice vote. <laughs> tough decision. Uh, I, I'm an obvious yes, and uh, Microsoft Office is working. You're gonna do what? Well, wait till after work. I appreciate that. Um, Ms. Roper, um, the vice mayor would like to reserve a hug for later, just so we can continue our meetings if that's okay? Okay, great. All right.
So we're going to go on to item number 31, which is receive and file auditor's report related to the uh, uh, fiscal year 2022 annual uh, financial audit, auditor's communication, uh, annual comprehensive financial report, development impact fee report, and our annual report on voter approved debt for the fiscal year ending June, tw June 30th, 2022. Uh, Kim Sitton, our finance director, will present the item. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I have to say that's a tough item to follow, but um, <laughs> so, <laughs> the dirt's still in my eye, so yeah. you're okay. <laughs> Try to make us cry. Don't listen to him. <laughs> well, I'm just going to give a really quick introduction and tell you that um, the, the items that you just listed are what's on the agenda item tonight for fiscal year 22. Yep. And I'm actually going to turn it over to um, Francis Co, a partner with our auditing firm, The Pun Group. And she's going to give a presentation and talk about the items that are um, presented tonight for council for their uh, receive and file. Great, thank you. Welcome. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and the member of council member. Um, my name is Francis Kuo. I'm the engagement partner for the audit of the city's financial statement. So thank you for the opportunity tonight to present the audit. And so what I will go over tonight is the scope of work, the required communication for the audit, and the overview of financial statement, some key pension and OPA information, and the audit result. So for fiscal year 21-22, we completed the audit of the city's financial statement and also completed the audit for the housing successor compliance audit and the trip reduction special revenue fund financial statement and the compliance audit, which is uh, related to the AQMD funding and the agreed upon procedures on the city's investment and the procedures on the appropriation limit schedule and also report on the internal control over the city's financial statement and compliance in accordance with the government auditing standards. So our responsibility in accordance with the professional professional standard uh, issued by the American Institute of the uh, Certified Public Accountant is to form and express the opinion on the financial statement. So the process of the audit is we'll plan and uh, perform the audit to obtain reasonable assurance on the financial statement amount. And how we do the audit is we will conduct the internal control uh, analysis of the financial reporting process. And in that process, it will help us design the audit procedure to provide a, a, an opinion on the financial statement amount, but not necessarily provide opinion on the inter internal control. But of, of course, during that process, if there's any internal control issue that we identify, we will communicate to those charter governance or the man management. So a couple required communication that we, uh, we are required to communicate in accordance with the professional standard is that we are uh, required to comply with all the relevant uh, ethical requirements, in including the in independence requirement. And we are also communicating the significant accounting policy of the financial statement. So the most important significant accounting policy are described in the notes to the financial statement in the note one. And one of the uh, policy that's being adopted during the year is related to the Gatsby Government Auditing uh, Accounting Standard Board, statement number 87 on the leases. So that brings a lot of lease arrangement to the uh, face of the financial statement that wasn't previously reported. So you have to report the lease in accordance with the Gatsby 87. And a couple other significant uh, estimates that's used by the management in preparing the financial statement involve the investment because the fair value, that's sub subjective. And then also the depreciation on the capital asset on the useful life and the net pension liability and the net other post-employment benefit liability, which also involve actual area estimate on the liability itself. So those are the significant estimates that's used by the ma uh, management to um, prepare the financial statements. 
And a couple other sensitive disclosure that's in the financial statement, of course, the note one on the summary of the significant accounting policy, and the note two on the stewardship compliance and account accountability, and note 13 and 14 about the city's pension plan and the other post-employment post benefit, because those are the two of the largest uh, liability of the city, and number 16 on the commitment and the contingency. And related to the misstatement, there were there were no uh, uncorrected misstatement that's been reported uh, for the audit. Um, also, there has been no uh, consultation with the audit accountant uh, related to uh, auditing and other matter during the course of the audit, and we have no dis uh, disagreement or uh, significant dis uh, difficulty dealing with the management uh, during the audit, whether it's related to the accounting treatment or on the audit procedures performed. So the next couple of slides will summarize uh, the government, uh, the financial statement in a high level picture. So you can, you can see the governmental activities and the business activity combined has a net position for the city of $1.2 billion, and of which uh, you have $1.1 billion that's invested in the capital asset net with the, uh, the related debt to put the capital asset together. And then you have $150 million of restricted resources uh, in the net position that's restricted through external uh, restriction, whether it's grant requirement or uh, enabling legislation. And end of the year, the governmental activity had $53 million of the unrestricted net position, and the business activity has $66 million of deficit, uh, unrestricted deficit. And this slide is going over the uh, the statement of activity of the uh, government, uh, the city. Uh, so the governmental activity for the and the business activity. So the net cost of service, which is the expenses that to carry out the city's program, whether for the governmental activity or the business activities. So the net cost of service is the expenses. Uh, and then covered by the uh, program revenue, what is charged for services that you're charging the, the residents or the rate payers, and then also the grant revenue specifically to provide those services and then the program. So the net cost of service is 87 million, uh, 86, 87 million for the governmental activity and about $10 million for the business activity. And the general revenue is used to provide uh, the, to provide the, um, the resources to cover the cost of service. So the governmental activity and the business activity combined has 160 million of general uh, revenue, which include um, unrestricted tax revenue and then also the investment earning. Uh, that's a general revenue. And so the net change in the position for the year is $83 million of increase in the net position. So if you look at the tax revenue, compare the tax revenue to the, uh, to the um, cost of service, it's at 55% of the cost of uh, service is provided by uh, uh, tax revenue. Now moving on to the general fund. So the general fund um, has uh, 20, um, 25 million dollars of increase in fund balance. So the city ended the year with a uh, 321 um, millions of uh, general fund fund balance, and 187 is non spendable, um, and the 30 million is the restricted fund balance, which is related to the uh, contribution that's made into the uh, separate pension uh, trust to help provide the future retirement of the city employees. And then $48 million of committed fund balance for contingency and emergency reserve, and the $55 million of assigned. And that leaves the city with a $222,000 of uh, unassigned fund balance. So in comparison with the prior, uh, prior fiscal year, that's a $25, $26 million increase in the general fund fund balance. So here's a comparison of the uh, statement revenue expenditure in change in fund balance compared to two years. So you could see that the $25 million of increase coming from the $191 million of the revenue uh, net worth expenditure of $390 million expenditure. And the reason for that big increase of the expenditure is related to the uh, unfunded liability contribution toward the CalPERS uh, contribution. And of course, there's uh, other financing sources with the pension issuance of pension obligation bond to help pay for uh, the unfunded liability with CalPERS. <clears throat> So now moving on to the pension and other post-employment information. So this is a comparison 
about the uh, 22 and 20 uh, of net pension liability. So the date on top is related to the measurement date because CalPERS is one year behind. So for the measurement date of uh, 2021, it's used to prepare, uh, report the 2022 financial statement. So for, uh, for the measurement date as of June 30th, 2021, uh, the net pension liability is at $164 million in, uh, compared to 2020, the year prior, uh, $261, uh, $261 million of net pension liability. So you do see a big uh, decrease in the net pension liability. And of course, when you take a look at what's the, re in, uh, what's the reason for the decrease, it's mainly related to the fiduciary net position, which is the plan asset that's been holding at the at CalPERS. So the investment was doing really well back in 2021. So you see there's a big increase in the fiduciary net position that bring down the net pension liability in the middle row here. So the funding ratio when, uh, was uh, at 81% um, for, uh, at the measurement date of 20, uh, June 30, 2021. And during the fiscal year 2020, the city has actually contributed $291 million toward the uh, pension contribution compared to 20, uh, 2021, the prior measurement period, uh, $33 million of contribution toward the retiree, retirement. Now about the other post-employment benefit, which related to the retiree uh, health benefit in the future. So the net OPEC liability for uh, for 2021, also as of the measurement date, June 30th, 2021, is at $85 million compared to in 2020 at $92 million. Uh, it's also related to the big increase in the investment earning. So the funding ratio for the, uh, 2021 is at 44% compared to 35% at 2020 and the contribution made toward the retiree benefit was at $10.7 million in 2022, and then $10.5 million in 2021. So the other result, so we are very happy to uh, uh, opine of, uh, to provide a unmodified opinion. So what that means is financial statements uh, are fairly presented and significant accounting policy has been uh, consistently applied, including the new implementation of the lease accounting standard. The estimates are reasonable and the disclosure are properly reflected in the financial statement. We also reported no uh, internal control related, related issue in our communication letter to the, to the city council here. So with that, conclude my presentation. I'm more than happy to answer any question you may have. Thank you, I appreciate that. Ms. Edwards, do we have any speaker cards from the public for this item? Mayor, we do not have any speaker cards. Excellent, um, I'll go to my colleagues for any questions. Oh, Vice Mayor, oh, Vice Mayor. Yeah, I just have one question in regards to the, I think it was $222,000 in the unassigned debt. Where, where does that end up going? Right there, unassigned. So it's really, um, so when you look at this, you're looking at kind of like a, a equity of this, the general fund, right? So you have all the fund balances. So it's up to the city, uh, to the city council have that, that can make decision to commit. So when we look at different category, so the committed fund balance is really coming from the city council that you commit through your resolution, and then it can only be removed through the same action. And the assigned fund balance are those projects or any uh, specific fund that's been set aside for that can be done through the management decision. And then so there sometimes will be some remaining that it's just unassigned, meaning that if there's no restriction from external party and has not been committed by the council or has not been uh, assigned by the management. So it's additional resources that's available for the city to, uh, to, to, to expand on. So it's slush fund, got it. Yeah, well, I guess it's always nice to find that once the, the on the balance sheet that there's money left over. <laughs> That's always you a good thing. You didn't have to take off your shoes or not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's always a good You're thing. You're good. Just one more thing I wanted to add is, I don't know if you recall at one of the quarterly adjustment um, presentations we were talking about that in the past we had added money to budget balancing measures at the end of each fiscal year, and we've stopped that practice now at the end of fiscal year 22. So now it just drops down to and shows as unassigned. And that's pretty standard across other agencies of what they do. It shows as unassigned fund. Um, so it's unassigned fund balance at the end of the fiscal years where that drops to the bottom line. I, of course, remember that presentation. Thank I'm you. I'm sure you do. Thank, Thank you so you. much. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, I didn't have any questions, just to thank you and always appreciate uh, uh, and thank you for, for coming back again. Um, we appreciate you did great work last time and uh, great report. Thank you. Thank you, um, too. This is uh, just a receiving file, so nothing needed from any of us. So we'll go on to item number 32, which is the city of Eastvale is requesting a letter of support from the city of Corona to support their independent zip code campaign. Uh, Denzel Maxwell, assistant to the city manager, will present the item. I guess the, that's what happens when you advertise yourself initially as Corona Valley. Good afternoon, Mayor, or good evening, Mayor and Council. <laughs> Uh, so about, about a month ago, uh, City of Eastville reached out. Uh, they've been working this process for a couple of years now, and what they're really trying to do is just to create their own zip code. Uh, they have a couple of issues uh, when it comes to addresses, having other names, not Eastville. Fun fact, they had to work to get their city hall to have an Eastville address. Um, and so this is really something that they want to do for those reasons of creating a uh, sense of place, as well as, uh, you know, mitigating some of the mail delivery issues they have, as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, when it comes to taxes, and as well as uh, when purchasing vehicles, that they have noticed that residents have had issues with that as well. So they reached out to the city to ask if we would uh, support a, uh, or uh, submit a letter of support uh, in their efforts. Okay. Um, does any, let's see. Uh, Ms. Edwards, are there any speaker cards from the public for this item? Mayor, we do not have any speaker cards. Do I have any comments or questions from my colleagues? Vice Mayor? Yeah, th so this is interesting. Being the, the District 2 representative, I border the Eastvale zip code. And when we changed from 92880, we went to 92878. And, I, and every online thing that I have to put my zip code in, it comes up Eastvale. So I'm very excited for them to have their own zip codes so that nobody mistakes me for an Eastvale resident. Not that that would be a bad thing, but it's not my jam. So. Great. Uh, yeah, n no issues with this. Uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a good thing for them. And uh, the vice mayor is right. I, I had lots of folks that were very aggravated that they were had to type in even in things for our own city. They kept saying, no, I live in Corona. I don't live in Eastville. So it kind of goes both ways. So this, this is uh, uh, all in favor. Do I have any? I don't need to make a vote, but you're good. Thumbs oh, up. We're not voting. Nope. Just thumbs up. Just thumbs up. Thumbs up. All right. We're good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, legislative matters. Uh, ordinance amending chapter 3.08 of the Corona Municipal Code to increase the alternative procedure amount you read that right? Alternative procedure amount in compliance with state law to make other changes to award criteria and award authority for maintenance and general services and revise the publication requirements for non-public projects. Does any council member want a staff report on this item? I, I had a heavy sigh over there. I thought maybe that was a yes. But. Okay, good job. Vice Mayor, see your finger on there. Uh, me neither. I thought the, the staff report was very well written and very well explained, so thank you. Um, Ms. Edwards, do we have any speaker cards from the public on this item? Mayor, no, we do not. Okay. So uh, do I have a motion? I'll take it for the team. I'll move. Okay. I'll second. Could you push the button? The motion needs to be read. Yeah, I'm going to read it. Okay, good. Um, City Council introduced by title only and waive full reading for consideration of ordinance number 3358. First reading of an ordinance amending chapter 3.08 of the Corona Municipal Code to increase the alternate alternative procedure amount in compliance with state law, make certain other changes to award criteria and award authority for maintenance and general services and materials, supplies and equipment, and revise the publication requirements for non-public projects. Okay, all right. So uh, you made the motion. Yep. Push button. Sorry. There you go. I'll second. Please vote. Our vote cast is down, so we will do a voice vote. Um, Councilmember Casillas? Aye. Councilmember Richens? Aye. Councilmember Steiner? Aye. Vice Mayor D'Addario? Aye. 
Mayor Speak. Aye. And the item passes five to zero. Okay, great. We're on to item number 34, which is ordinance setting commercial cannabis business tax rates pursuant to measure G adopted by the voters. Um, does any council member want a staff report on this item? Nope, me either. Um, Ms. Edwards, are there any speaker cards from the public? Mayor, we do not have any speaker cards. I know the city attorney really looked like he wanted to talk. So. No, I just want to note for the record how short I kept this ordinance title for you. <laughs> and you just made it longer, but thanks. I'll make a motion then. <laughs> okay, so no questions or comments. Okay, excellent. Do you have a motion? I'll push the button and make a motion. Okay, do you have a second? Second. The damn button doesn't work. Please vote. The as short as as read. short as it is, you have to read the title. I'm excited to read this motion. It's uh, introduced by title only and waive full reading of ordinance number three three five nine setting commercial cannabis business tax rates. Look at that. Councilmember Casillas. Aye. Councilmember Richens. Aye. Councilmember Steiner. Aye. Vice Mayor Dario. Aye. Mayor Speak. Aye. And the item passes five to zero. Okay. On to uh, boards and commissions. Uh, Planning Commission, we have none. Parks Commission, we have none. Uh, regional meeting report from Councilmember Jim Steiner on the RTA board meeting of November 17th. Yeah, right. Okay, so um, RTA implemented a $5 monthly pass promotion uh, that started December 1st and it goes through January 31st of next year. Um, Eight new nonprofits were added to the agency's wait list for retired vehicle donations. RTA received an unmodified or clean opinion on their basic financial statements and their internal control over financial reporting and compliance. And then on January 8, 2023, RTA will launch Route 56, funded by UCR and open to the public. This route will provide meaningful connections between the university and the Hunter Park Metrolink station. That completes my report. Wow, quick quick finish there. All right, uh, Vice Mayor Daddario on the uh, RCA meeting of December 5th. Yep, thank you, Mayor. Um, so a couple updates. Uh, we held elections for chair and vice chair. Um, remaining as chair will be Natasha Johnson from Lake Elsinore, and the vice chair will be uh, Kevin Bash from the city of Norco, or North Corona, as he likes to say. Um, Couple good conversations we had. Um, there was one purchase that we made of 23 acres uh, for conservation. And there was a report that was read out from uh, Director Hake about his trip to Sacramento and the meeting that they had with the California Wildlife Conservation Board. The state of California has uh, started to let go of the purse strings, if you will, and have opened up a large sum of money for uh, grant opportunities to purchase um, land for conservation. So there are several um, opportunities that uh, RCA is taking in order to um, get some of that money and uh, be able to uh, use it to buy um, land for conservation. They went over the independent auditor's report from Brown and, Arms from Brown and Armstrong. It was a riveting report. They didn't find that um, there was any... Um, any spending out of place, it was um, reported out very well that uh, the RCA is is uh, uh, very fiscally responsible with the money that they have for the MSHCP. And always exciting, the Species of the Month Club, and I can't make up these names. I really can't. The Species of the Month for this month was the Santa Ana Sucker. That's an awesome fish which Wes and like three other people know exactly what that is. It's a fish that lives in, in our waterways and tributaries. Um, I, I, I don't even want to repeat it because of, of the way that they presented it, but the fish itself lives, for, lives, lives to be about four inches long and uh, lays four to 16,000 eggs and lives in shallow water. Um, and again, it's the Santa Ana sucker. That's cute little puppy lips. Look just like a puppy. I, now, now <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that concludes my report of the RCA. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> okay. All right. You, um, update from the vice mayor is going to continue here on the Western Riverside County Regional Wastewater Authority Board of Directors meeting of December 1st. So thank you for covering that for me. Yep. Uh, went ahead and covered that one because the mayor here decided to get married and go on his honeymoon. So that was a, it was another um, interesting meeting. Uh, the Western Riverside County Regional Wastewater Authority, or is it WICRA, Mr. Moody? Okay. WICRA? Um, my wife and I had a whole conversation about government and their acronyms. Um, the most of the majority of, of the of the agenda was a receiving file, but there's a couple things that I did pull out. Um, they did their capital facilities plan. Um, there was a company, uh, where is it? Um, Aqua Web that did the uh, the draft for the capital facilities plan. It's a five year plan where they've decided to to lay out the capital improvements of the River Road facility. It's outlined by priority and it's very detailed. Um, we had some conversation about the ability of Western Municipal Water District to complete this project in house. And it seems like um, the WRCRWA is going to be proposing to get some outside help in order to, to, um, to complete this plan. It's, um, it's a very detailed plan. They went through that facility top to bottom and really called out all the things that really um, needed to be repaired. And again, they're doing it by priority. Um, for those of us that were interested to know, the, the Western Riverside County Regional Wastewater Authority is made up of the city of Corona, the city of Norco, Home Garden Sanitary District, Harupa Community Services District, and the Western Municipal Water District. And the largest amount of time that we spent, um, one of the members brought up the fact that the board members on WRCRWA are unpaid board members. And there was some conversation about whether or not the, the board members in order to attract people that want to actually serve on this board and go through the 900 pages of staff report, thank you Wes, because um, apparently I'm the only other sucker that will read it except for you. Um, Man. Yeah. <laughs> which included three or four calls to Mr. Moody to try to understand what it was all about. Um, but, you know, it, it actually made a lot of sense to me to listen, you know, as electeds, we are appointed to different boards, and the conversation really is around, you know, being compensated for our time in order to want to actually participate. Sometimes you're on these boards and you feel like some people aren't reading the staff reports, they don't know exactly what's going on, they're not really paying attention. And in order to attract folks on a small group like this, it seems as if um, compensating them for their time, although it's a very small amount, really makes up um, or really makes some sense. So uh, next month you'll have some decisions to make. <laughs> Good luck. Okay. And that concludes my report. All right, great. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Durlitz, do you have any comments tonight? Nope. Mr. Ellis, any comments tonight? Mayor, I'll be quick. Um, it's our last meeting, regular council meeting of the year. Um, so I just wanted to quickly make a comment or two. First of all, great, great meeting today. Um, it has been a busy year. It's been a challenging year. Uh, but more importantly, I think it's been a great year in Corona. And uh, I just wanted to thank the council for your continued support and partnership. I wanted to thank all of our leadership team, most of whom you see here on the front row tonight. I cannot overemphasize how important these people are to making our city a success. A success. And, uh, and I also want to give a shout out to the 850 other employees who we don't, we don't call them up by name very often. They don't get a lot of recognition, but they go about their jobs day to day. They're on the front lines. They are what make our whole city run. And, uh, and I wanted to give a huge shout out to them as well. And of course, our residents, our businesses who support the city and make it what it is. So just wanted to, to, uh, to, offer up some appreciation from a, for a great year. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Okay, on to council member reports, council member Casillas. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Ellis, you totally um, captured the reflective mode. I feel, to, I, I'm, I, I feel um, towards the end of the year, really, this assessment of, you know, have we done, what kind of work have we done? Can we, are we proud of it? Are we excited about, um, you know, what we've been able to accomplish. And so I just, I really appreciate that because it's true. We don't um, often take a, a moment to breathe in between 
everything that's getting done and to say thank you. And so this was just one of those really good meetings and I think your comments summarized it really well. So thank you to you, to the leadership, to full staff um, in the city. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to, to be a part of this. So I just have a couple of comments because I didn't make the agenda deadline and I actually did go to a couple of regional meetings and I wanted to report back on it. Um, I will provide a written report for my WR COG meeting that happened this Monday, but just real quick, um, we, the agenda was pretty straightforward. I mean, we had some TUMF reim reimbursement agreement questions and amendments. Um, we had a, a cost study um, contract. Um, we had um, WR COG representatives appointed to various outside committees. I think the, the biggest thing on the agenda this Monday was that we covered um, an energy resilience plan, which is exciting, but also, you know, these plans, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of plans like this that aren't really grounded in like practical, like real practical, you know, it just, it, anyway, I want some like tangible. Meat. I want some meat, you know, but, uh, but it, anyway, it, it came through, that's Those fine. <laughs> I want some meat and vegetables. Um, so this, this plan is really supposed to provide a framework for, you know, local government to identify facilities, how to prioritize facilities for, um, you know, energy efficiency, and then how to evaluate and design these implementations. It's, it's like a, here's how to do your job well for energy efficiency, and that's great. Um, but where I'm really excited to move the needle is that next week we'll have our very first IREN meeting, and I'm, um, I was selected to serve on this, on this, um, on uh, this uh, agency, and this is actually puts us as one of eight program administrators in the state, and makes us this region eligible for um, for big dollars from the state of California. So we all pay a public a public goods charge for our energy, and because we haven't had a position, we haven't ha been administrators. That money has been going to different RENs in the region, but not one to ours. But we formed this IREN, and now we have 65.5 million through 2027. That's going to um, Riverside and San Bernardino count counties, and I'm one of our reps on this. And these dollars will actually help local municipal governments do things like pay for technical assistance, so that's actual uh, rebates for software, energy audits, and design work. So that's some meat and potatoes there. It'll allow us to have rebates for member agencies and to, and to um, maybe have a tool for financing programs. So it was great. The meeting was great. We had this report. That's wonderful. But I'm really looking forward to um, having a, a real tool and real um, um, resources for our region and specifically for the city of Corona to take advantage of energy efficiency projects and moving the needle here locally. So that's WR COG, but I will submit a formal report and maybe that'll come through in January. Um, the second report that I missed the deadline to provide, but I'd like to provide orally to you all, is that I meant mention earlier today that um, I had the the uh, honor of uh, going up to Monterey, thank you all very much, um, to serve as a rep at the Cal Cities League Leaders um, meeting. And I'm really happy to, um, to share that that meeting um, uh, yielded our, our priority, um, uh, I'm trying to pull it up as I speak, it's trying to yield our, our annual advocacy priorities. So let me pull this up real quick because I want to do it justice. Um, where did I send it to? Here we go. Um, no, it isn't. Here it is. One second, guys. It's all good. Uh, where did I send it? I don't see it here. So we had four um, we had four priorities, and I've rattled off a few already, right? One was it's addressing homelessness and having homelessness as its own um, uh, advocacy um, target. 
In the past, the league leaders have advocated for homelessness and housing as one big bucket. And while those things are intricately related, it's kind of a disservice to one and the other because there are there's there's some baggage, right, to one issue and to the other. And this is where I give credit to um, to Ms. Roper for really equipping me with the terminology to go up and be in a room full of council members, supervisors, you know, um, other leaders across the state and hold my own and saying these two things are important and they should both be priorities, but they should be their own and unique distinct priorities. And we were successful. So housing is one of the top four, addressing housing. Homelessness is one of the top four. Um, creating a sustainable fiscal government is one of the top four. And lastly, public safety. And so these will become the four advocacy um, um, top priorities for 2023. And as the chair of the Community Services Committee for California League Leaders, I will oversee um, homelessness. And so we'll be doing a lot of partnership and essentially just changing the way that our cities are talking about homelessness. And hopefully, you know, um, I'll be able to sh share Corona as a case study for these cities across the state of what you can do when you have political will, good timing, good people. Um, and this is definitely the time, so people shouldn't be hesitating to do something um, to move the needle. So that's it for my report out, Mayor. And if you'll come back after, I do um, yep. want to thank you. Yep. Councilmember Richens. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. I think uh, the next time I order sushi, I'm going to get the Santa Ana sucker. So I'm pretty excited about that. It's not a very big fish. Oh, well, then yeah, you'll, you'll be species. Yeah. Well, then I guess I won't eat the Santa Ana sucker. The uh, uh, me and Riverbell had a chance to go to the city park pop up event, and uh, it couldn't have been any more super organized. And what it was is, uh, um, well, two bounce houses can't beat that. But they they wouldn't let me jump, and uh, but Riverbell enjoyed it. There was booths, there was tacos, there was all sorts of interviews, and um, it was really cool to see the uh, the community be involved in that. And if you get a chance, head on over to the City of Corona Facebook page. There's two videos on it. One is with Tree Warden War Tree Warden Moses, and it's super good video. Um, It'll, it'll make you want to go to City Park if you watch this thing. And then next is uh, the Crossings had their tree lighting ceremony, and it was cool. Dos Lagos had its tree lighting ceremony. And just to give you an update on Dos Lagos, the owner of Dos Lagos spoke to the crowd, and uh, he said they have just finished phase one of four phases over at Dos Lagos. And uh, they couldn't be any more excited to go into phase two, and just phase two alone sounded phenomenal. And phase three and phase four, these, these guys are really out to make Dos Lagos a destination point. And then last but not least, um, the city of Corona tree lighting ceremony was just, um, it, it couldn't have gone any better. There, there's, a, there's people, out there that kind of just do things and not know what they're doing and then get tasked with putting on an event and they'll struggle their way through it. And then there's people out there that can master plan and really think it out and run the event through their head before, before the event ever takes place. And if you were to attend last Sunday night's tree lighting ceremony, you would have witnessed a very well master planned event. The spacing was great. The snowball area, um, they moved it to where it was more open. They made it to where people could sled and play. They, uh, every little point of it was just perfectly thought out. There was a climbing tower. There were slides. There was a balancing beam, which I did make across. There was, uh, um, there was booths, and there was stuff inside and outside, and and most and Santa Claus, but most importantly is you saw everybody there was just happy. There, there was nobody sad, they were just happy. And then uh, this evening I had a chance to talk to Dr. Turner and um, 
I, I, I just wonder where she comes up with ideas because she's telling me about the Christmas tree and they're going to plant one here and plant one this year. It's going to go somewhere. I don't know where, but so and they wouldn't tell me if they did. <laughs> she, she's learned a lesson. She's not going to yeah. tell you anything anymore. But it's going to go somewhere, and then she's all like, hey, listen up, Richens. They're, we're going to get like 10 of these in the ground, and then we're going to put plaques, and then we're going to light them all up and fly drones, and, and it's just it's just a my rate of details and really it's how cool can you make your city that's that was it it was how cool can you make your city and our city is cool so that sorry to take so long but that's my report and i will adjourn thank you mayor thank you councilmember steiner yeah i just want to reiterate the tree lighting was amazing and there was probably a dozen kids out there today when i drove by still sledding on the snow but um, nothing but great, great comments from the public. Um, just wonderful. Wish everybody happy holidays. Um, and this is, this is Mayor Speaks' last council meeting as mayor. So I just wanted to thank you. Uh, I don't think I've met anybody quite as passionate as you. Um, <laughs> you were saying that that way, such not the other way you and were going to say it. <laughs> um, or sends as many emails. I think uh, Jacob's probably stoked that you're no longer going to be there. Um, <laughs> but you did a great job, and thank you for leading us this year. Thank you. I appreciate that. Vice Mayor? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, let's see. I, I was able to attend a couple of events these last couple of weeks. Uh, attended the Rotary Club's 100th anniversary. It was at Eagle Glen. It was a great event put on and kind of a walk through time on, on – um, on, on the Corona Rotary in Corona. Um, I was able to attend the uh, Coffee with an Entrepreneur at the Chamber event uh, last Monday. And the, uh, the guests that was speaking were the founders and owners of Happiest Hours. And what a wonderful story that they told about how, um, how Happiest Hours came to be. And it was... Um, a thought that one of the owners had, and it was just rattling around in his head for a couple of years, and he had to figure out and what he went through to get it, and the support that he found in his uh, in his wife and and his cousin, uh, and the story to where it is today, and and uh, most importantly, what they're doing to the future in the future, or what their future plans are. And I'll tell you what, that's a business that I'm excited to watch, as, as I am all of the businesses in Corona, but I think that one. Um, is going to be something that we're going to see quite a bit of and a lot of good stuff in the upcoming years. Uh, it was a great event. Thank you to the chamber for putting that on. Thank you for having, you know, great speakers that were engaging and, and, um, you know, you know, it, it actually, oddly enough, it actually moved me to get up and say something at the end, which I normally don't do. Usually it's Bobby throwing a microphone at me saying, here, go ahead and say something. Um, but I actually wanted to, to advocate for them, um, for the business owners in our community, it was it was really uh, beneficial to to see. I mean, it was a mini MBA for some people where they're talking about, <clears throat> you know, um, the data analytics that they're using and and the way that they're leveraging social media and all the different things that they're doing. It's a real real well thought out plan for a group of people that actually have no back. Their their backgrounds are so diverse that. Um, you would never think that, that that as a group that's where they were going to end, but the 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 culmination of their backgrounds really lends itself to running a business. So that was uh, that was great to see. Um, and then also I wanted to touch on the tree lighting ceremony. That's become my new favorite event in Corona. It really has. Uh, I got to, I showed up there around two o'clock. I had to run some errands in town, and I showed up there just to see how the setup was going. And and I showed up right when the uh, I want to say it was like a truck full of ice that they turned into snow somehow was leaving and it was uh, fresh powder and and um, they didn't have any slides so I wasn't able to go down the the snow um, that's okay I wasn't hurt um, but you know I want to shout out to Jose Correa who was running around like uh, a, almost a madman trying to put on the final touches he just did a great job you know uh, organizing the event and making sure things were were uh, well placed. They were decorating in the historic civic center, and the art association was getting set up, and all the booths were getting set up. and And my family and I got to attend that evening. And other than the line for the um, the little um, 
excavators in the sand, you having to wait for that. That was a that was a big hit with a lot of the kids and and I feel bad for whoever had to clean up the sand afterwards because they did not keep it in the sandbox. But uh, I also did not try the slack line. I wanted to keep my ankles. Uh, but watching the kids do that, that was a lot of fun. And, and the rock climbing and, and of course, the, uh, the countdown to the tree lighting, which is just great to see Historic Civic Center all lit up and decorated for Christmas and the carolers and, and everything. Um, I can personally attest to the, the, I think it was a pupusa vendor that was fantastic. I'm now a fan of pupusas. Those are awesome. So um, that, was, that was something new for me. No vegetables were hurt in the eating of the pupusas, thankfully. Um, but it was a great event. So hats off to Dr. Turner and her team. A, another well-run, well-thought-out, and well-executed event. So thank you very much. Looking forward to next year. Okay, uh, thank you. And I, I don't have a, I only have a couple things. One, there was a, a SCAG meeting that I didn't put on there, but I'm not going to talk about it because it's really boring and we didn't do much but talk for two hours about goals. And, you know, even though those are great, and I know that Councilmember Casillas is so jealous, we were talking about resilience and conservation subcommittee. It was really good. But um, when we actually do something, I'll come back and talk about it. Um, I, I did attend the, uh, on the 17th, the Western Retail Water Agency Roundtable. Um, it was frightening um, hearing from MWD folks that we don't have any water, from the Western Municipal Water District folks that saying we have water, it's in the ground, we're, we're gonna get it out, but there's not a lot of it, and we're in trouble. Um, in fact, there's, they have a, a new program they're putting on called Solve the Water Crisis, if you go to solvethewatercrisis.com, um, has some storage ideas and some other things that really trying to push uh, from a regional aspect, uh, getting cities together, getting regional water folks together. It's a great, you should basically, people should watch this, should go and read it. They have a really great website. Um, we, are, we are definitely in trouble uh, water-wise, looking at, at how, how much actual water is allocated to us from the Colorado River and from the State Water Project, there is a massive deficit. The State Water Project wasn't meant to store anything. It was just meant to confer or convey what is in, in storage right now, which means what's on the hill. <clears throat> and there's no storage. So we are, like I said, in, in trouble. So it was uh, it, it, you know, frightening, but, but nice to be able to hear that and, and be able to, to push it out. I want to echo the holiday lighting. I mean, you guys said at the last meeting that it you know, you want to take to step it up a notch and you knocked it out of the park. Uh, I think the numbers were at least four or five, 6,000 people. I've never seen that many people, more 10,000. That's the number I think I, I heard a little bit earlier. Um, I got there a little late. I, I, I spent 12 hours on a plane. I woke up at one o'clock in the morning, but I was not going to miss it. I actually landed, took a, took a not really a nap, but Went home, changed, and then uh, drove over, and I, I wouldn't have missed it. It was great, and it was great seeing so many smiling faces, um, and I didn't even see everything. So it was great to see, and, and, and Jose and, and Jason just did a phenomenal job. They were really ran it like a top, and it, it was great. Um, before we uh, adjourn, I wanted to say two things. One, today is Pearl Harbor Day. Um, I kind of recall, got really lucky. One of the things about growing up uh, in Corona in the 80s, um, had a bunch of teachers that were World War II veterans. Um, physics teacher, Mr. Engel, when I was at Corona High School, was a, a Pearl Harbor survivor. He'd actually got blown off of two ships, um, and he would shut his class down and, and tell anybody um, on that day what exactly happened to him, and it was really uh, uh, amazing. So I want to make sure I keep reiterating that, and we don't, we don't forget, because it is, is uh, a huge part of our history. Um, big shout out to uh, Dominic Veretti and his uh, nonprofit Lila Project. They were featured on multiple NFL players' shoes. They have a, a program in the NFL called Mike Cleats My Cause, and um, through his connections, he was able to have uh, several NFL players have the Lila Project uh, displayed on their on their cleats on Sunday. So it was really cool to see that and his success, um, and you know, sharing a little bit with the city of Corona. So I, I like that. Um, Thank you, Councilmember Steiner, for acknowledging today is my it is my last council meeting. I know I'll be doing this at least one more time as we uh, shift over. But I, I want to say a uh, I 
I mentioned the word patience a lot in the last, you know, on uh, item number 30. But I want to say thank you for your patience with me and, and my, um, my uh, long uh, report sometimes, um, but also with, you know, my many questions and you know where it comes from a, a good place. And thank you to staff for, for listening to me dive into things ad nauseum detail. So, um, but no, it's, it's uh, all for good. So, um, and I got married. Yeah, that's right. I have, I have a wife. I'm, I'm getting used to saying that. I'm pretty, pretty happy. Had a great time. And thank you all for, for, uh, for filling in on uh, various things. Uh, Council Merchants did a great job at both of the tree lighting ceremonies. And I heard, heard lots of good things back. In fact, I think I, they're not going to ask me back next year. So uh, we're good there. Um, but uh, I, we are not going to have a meeting uh, in, dis in December 21st. Um, we will have a committee the whole meeting. Um, December 14th, and then we will come back into this room a little bit later on and do the swearing in for the three of us, and, and congratulations, um, and uh, we'll uh, elect our, our new lead. So again, thank you for allowing me to sit in this chair. It is a, quite an honor um, uh, to represent the city, and, and uh, hopefully I've done a, a good job. So thank you all very much, and with that, I think uh, Council Member Casillas had uh, someone that she wanted to uh, adjourn the meeting for. Thank you. And I just want to say, I'm saving my words for your next meeting. Okay, Because this perfect. is your like final, your last council meeting, but we still have one yeah. more where we can get happy. Yeah. So, no, I appreciate it. Um, Mayor, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to close today's meeting in honor of a colleague of mine who passed suddenly, uh, Phil Williams, um, who's a lifelong Lake Elsinore resident and a longtime public servant. I had the honor of serving with him uh, on the Bedford Coldwater Groundwater Sustainability Authority um, that you hear me report out on. Um, we've been serving together since 2019. He um, died suddenly, um, but he was a great guy. He was kind, knowledgeable, dedicated um, to his community. And he is survived by his wife, Tammy, and their children and grandchildren, and um, keeping them all in our hearts and in our prayers. So just want to. Um, close today in honor of Phil. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you all on December 14th. Thank you.